Welcome everyone to the uh, July 1st, 2019 Planning Board for the Town of Scarborough, Maine. If you could all join me in ri rising for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, Thank you everyone for participating. That was fun. Uh, next item is the roll call. Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Nicholas McGee. Here. Roger Bealey. Here. Rick, uh, Jennifer Ladd. Here. Rick Meinking. Here. Thank you. We have, uh, we have one of our voting members out tonight and our first alternate out tonight, which means Rick Meinking will be a uh, voting member this evening. And then um, just for some housekeeping uh, notes, we have an incredibly long agenda this evening. So if you are here uh, with um, a proposal, an application, we've seen it before, please assume that we've read the uh, materials, kind of try to stick to a general overview uh, quickly, and then of course into any of those main talking points that you would have received in staff comments. Um, and then another housekeeping note, if you are actually here for uh, Ballantine development, there is a chance that we will not get to it. We stop taking up new business at 10 p.m. So, um, the choice is yours. <laughs> we will, I guess, uh, move as swiftly as we possibly can through this agenda. With that said, um, we don't have any minutes. Uh, they're going to be tabled, still in progress. So, the first item on the agenda tonight is the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance, to amend Section 6, Definitions of Affordable Housing. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as you all may recall, a series of amendments to the definition of affordable housing uh, were advanced by the Housing Alliance and approved by Town Council late last year. In the course of this process, there was an inadvertent error that has significant implications on the viability of owner-occupied units. Um, so since income limits depend on the size of a household, this presents a challenge for developers of affordable housing and establishing a sale price. So for purposes of calculating the allowed household income, section A, subsection 3, the definition prescribes a methodology for what income limit is to be used depending on the number of bedrooms in the unit. The intention of the Housing Alliance was to, was to use one bedroom as a determinant, however two bedroom is a standard in the current draft. The proposed amendment is a simple change from two to one. Uh, though, simple, though simple, this change is critical to making this program practical and viable. Turn it back to you. Thank you, Chamel. Um So with that said, is there any comment from the planning board? It's a pretty straightforward adjustment to the current language. We have opportunity for public comment. Anyone like to speak, just approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, no public comment. Any board comments on this? Yes, Rick. I'm not an English. I'm not an English major by any stretch, but that uh, sentence just seemed a little funky by saying a unit which has one or fewer bedrooms. If you have one, how can you have fewer? So that's my only comment. The teacher would have given you an A. <laughs> that would be my first A I ever got. <laughs> um, so with that, maybe uh, a recommendation to remove the or fewer bedrooms language following the one. Yes? All right. Yes. What, what I'm not clear is that you can have fewer if you have a studio apartment. So I'm not clear what the, the Housing Alliance was interested in, whether it has studio apartment or, or small housing with in effect, no bedrooms, just simply a studio area. So I, I don't know what that change would do to the uh, intent of the housing lines. That's fair. Um, any, any rebuttal on that? We can leave the language as it is with the recommendation that they make sure that the studio aspect of it is addressed. Um, and if not, I guess we'd see it again. All right. I see a lot of nodding heads. That's what we're going to go with. Thank you very much. Next item of business is the Hospice of Southern Maine requests a site plan review for 390 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map R62, Lot 29B. 
Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this project's located in the B3 zoning district, uh, located uh, sort of kitty cornered behind uh, Holy Donut along Route 1. So the applicant was, was last before the board at your May meeting. Um, just a reminder, they're proposing a 14,550 square foot single story building. It will serve as the main office for clinical and administrative staff. The applicant's also proposing two ground mount mounted solar arrays and a geothermal well that will serve the building. So as requested, the width of the entrance-only driveway along Route 1 has been reduced to 16 feet wide. The applicant is proposing to install two entrance-only signs facing Route 1. Uh, given that motorists will be allowed to enter the site from Route 1, staff has recommended that these signs be removed. The board may recall the applicant's proposing an informal grass pathway along the Lincoln Avenue driveway. Uh, staff has recommended a stone dust pathway to provide for a more formal connection uh, to Lincoln Ave which has been identified as a popular walking route. So the applicant should discuss this with the board. And staff has provided the board with a draft motion with, uh, with conditions for your consideration. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you. Andy Johnson from Atlantic Resource Consultants, uh, representing Hospital Southern Maine. As Jamal said, I think we covered most of the, the staff and the board review comments at the last meeting. We were, in fact, really just waiting for the DEP permit, which we now have in hand. And the last two items, uh, I was a little uh, neglectful in getting back to Jamel, asking for clarification on the signs, the entrance only signs. We're fine with removing those, and we understand now the reason for that is just to get rid of some of the sign clutter along the frontage of the site. So um, the applicant is, is absolutely agreeable to that. On the um, pathway, the applicant would prefer to maintain that as grass. Um, we do hope that it gets some good use throughout the year, and um, we, we see it really specifically as a seasonal trail. We'd like to think that people will use it uh, more frequently, but in lieu of some of the comments that we had from the board, particularly a couple of members of the board, uh, Rachel's here, Robin is not this evening, regarding how little impervious area we could put on the site or what we could do to reduce impervious area. We really didn't want to make that a stone dust trail until we see that there's going to be significant traffic there, at which time we may come back and ask for, a, for an amendment to the site plan to do that. But until we know that there's going to be that volume of traffic along the trail, we'd prefer to leave it as pervious and a more natural looking trail. Um, that they are the only two outstanding items, I think, left for the board, but of course we're here and happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. And uh, just to, for clarification, there are no other issues in staff comments that you, you have an issue uh, adjusting? No. Nope. Oh, Thanks. We're good. Okay. Um, so it sounds to me like we really just have one one item to provide some direction on, and that's that stone stone dust path versus a just a grass uh, path. Does anyone want to try to jump in and maybe provide some guidance for the applicant? Yes, Roger. Um, I would tend to um, agree with the applicant on this and uh, go along with that, uh, as long as it's a condition that should uh, you know the sidewalk be warranted in the future. You come back you know, and deal with it through staff or something like that. Rachel? Yeah, um, well, my name was just used about the amount of impervious service. I'm, I'm going to just kind of throw that, um, throw that statement out because I, I, I think what I see here and is the question of the chicken and the egg. You're uh, proposing going taking a look at seeing how many people use the maintained grass path um, to decide if there's enough traffic to warrant the stone dust traff, uh, path. And it's again, it, it's the chicken and the egg. If folks really don't see a defined path, even though you're maintaining the grass, they might not realize that that's actually a path, whereas a stone dust path says this is a path. You can walk on it. So without the stone dust, you're not going to get an accurate picture of how people are going to use that path. Um, but you're asking that we wait to find out how many people are going to use it, and that starts to take us down a rabbit hole. So I guess um, this is a case where I would come down on the side of the uh, stone dust path 
uh, to make it clear right from the beginning that folks, this is, this is a place that's open for you to walk. Thank you, Rachel. So we've got one of each. So we're gonna need Jen and Rick to weigh in, please. Um, so I actually was thinking the same um, chicken and egg, egg phrase as well as Rachel. I, I think especially if when you're establishing a new site like this, um, to provide that visual cue to people that this is an option would certainly be helpful and that once, once, you, once people get accustomed to working and or visiting here, um, our human nature just sort of tends to be a little di more difficult to change um, and that if you were to establish that as an option for recreation or healthy walking at lunch or whatever. Um, those are behaviors that might be harder to encourage, say in a year, you know, if the applicant does decide um, to switch it over at that point. I, I do have a question about um, where, you're, where you're talking about potentially coming back later if you deem, if the applicant deems that the, um, the stone dust treatment is warranted, would you be accounting for that um, difference in your stormwater calculations now, or would you be doing that in the future? I have, to be honest with you, I haven't run the numbers, but I suspect, and and I've sized all the bioretention cells. They're actually all oversized, so I suspect okay. we would have to do nothing on that front. The issue we were more faced with was we went through the the whole thing about the parking and trying to reduce the parking and trying to reduce the impervious, and so once you put in the stone dust. It's you're not going to come back and take it out. Yeah. So we were trying to take a kind of precautionary approach to it and see what the level of traffic is and then come back and put the stone dust trail in afterwards. And, you know, we can work this either way. It's, we were more concerned about the impacts of the impervious, perhaps, than we were about the, the high traffic. I, I know that having worked on similar projects like this in the past, sometimes that amount of area can make or break it if your numbers are close. Um, but if you're confident that there's there's room allowed in your um, in your calculations, um, I, I think this I noticed this option um, very quickly upon looking at your site plan right off the bat, and I just think it's a really great amenity for both your um, employees, you know, the employees that would be working there, and maybe and maybe folks that might be visiting. Um, so I guess I I would also be in favor of of um, putting that in. Recognizing you. that you've done a good job looking to, to limit um, impervious areas elsewhere, yeah. Thank you. Rick? Well, we can make the chair be the deciding vote, huh? <laughs> um, I would be in favor of allowing the use and see how it goes, uh, given the, all the other stuff you're doing on that property, uh, the solar panels and those kind of things. Um, I could definitely wrap myself around um, a grass walkway a lot more if I knew there were a couple charging stations in the parking lot for employees with EVs. So um, I'm kind of leaning both ways, but I could be swayed if somebody said there was going to be a couple of EV chargers there. Uh, with that, I will side with a grass. Thanks, Rick. Um, so just to make things murkier for you, um, I'm going to quickly ask the board how they would feel about stone dust pathway being tied to the future parking area. If the asphalt was ever needed for more parking, at that point, ask them to make it stone dust. Don't know how you'd feel about that. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. Uh and I guess what I would have to think is, so if we agree that there's more impervious, then I would say no to the storm, the stone dust, um, because that would add even more to the impervious surface. So if they do put in that extra parking, um, then that would be the point where we would really want to look at more grass. So it, it's a, it's tough, you know, to think, what if this and what if that, um, and. I don't, that's, that's yeah, my, my response. Thought. I do have one more thing. There is one mention here of trees. The, the staff had mentioned more uh, trees along the, 
the uh, driveway to Lincoln Avenue, and I think you really responded to that uh, before, and I have no problem with leaving the plan as it is without those trees, just in case it comes up. Thank you. And uh, just so we're clear, my thoughts behind linking the two were actually based on p possible pedestrian traffic, not necessarily impervious surface. So right. thinking that maybe that would be more utilized with more parking and more visitors, that would be a good time to install a, maybe a more formal sidewalk area. Leave, leave grass for now and then revisit if you had to come back for parking. Yes, Roger. Um, I think the parking, if, if that's going to become an issue, that's going to be a priority. And once you have the stone dust down, I don't think you're going to be taking that back up. True. So I'm still sticking with the grass sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> it, it leaves more options. Yeah. Uh, anyone else have thoughts? I have a question. What would be the difference between a maintained grass pathway and just grass or lawn? Well, the idea is that there's going to be a mowed strip, so a lot of the grass in there is, is going to be allowed to naturalize, like the grass Longer. and the swales is only going to be mowed a couple of times a year. So if you go through the site now, some of that brush will be cleared, but a lot of the stuff going off towards the edges will be a more natural type meadow. So there'd be a mowed strip down where that path is going. And is, what's the width on that that you're thinking? It's five feet. Five feet. I think the, what I'm struggling with, just so you know, is how do we know the pedestrian traffic has hit a point where you need to come back and talk to us about a stone dust pathway? I think what it'll be, it'll be, it'll be reflected by the site use, and frank, frankly, the applicant will want to do it. If that grass pathway starts getting worn and starts getting muddy, we'll want to come in to make it, as a maintenance issue, we'll want to come in and, and put a more formal surface on it so it doesn't erode away and people aren't getting muddy when they're walking down it. So I think... You know, once that traffic gets to a certain degree, it'll be in the applicant's best interest to come back and, and formalize that path. Any other thoughts from the board on this? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll say I'm inclined to see how the grass works for you. Um, I do I do appreciate the, the thoughts of uh, chicken and egg because I could see that. You know, if you have a stone dust path, people are more likely to use it. Absolutely can see it. However, I also don't want to see some impervious area added if we're not necessarily utilizing it. So that being said, let's try the grass, see how it goes. Um, and we're going to trust the applicant to hold to his word that they want to see it built if it's utilized. So, okay. Uh, any other thoughts or comments on this? Okay, with that, I have moved to approve the site plan project titled Hospice of Southern Maine, proposed by Hospice of Southern Maine, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Atlantic Resource Consultants, dated 6-10-19, with the following findings and conditions. The applicant is proposing to construct a 14,550-square-foot single-story building that will serve as the main office for clinical and administrative staff. The building will also include a family bereavement suite, community room, training suite, employee cafe, and multi-purpose meeting rooms. The applicant is also proposing two ground-mounted solar arrays and geothermal well field that will serve the proposed building. The property will utilize existing frontage on Route 1 and Lincoln Avenue. The property is located within the General Business B3 Zoning District and is identified on the Tarbos, Town of Scarborough's tax maps, map R62, lot 29B. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions are as follows. One, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, the removal of an entrance-only signs associated with the Route 1 driveway. B, a plan note indicating when the parking lot lights shall be dimmed as discussed with the planning board. C, update the Route 1 trench detail as noted in the staff review comments memo dated 7-1-19. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. That is the motion. There's more. On the back, there's more. <laughs> Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees, B, execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance, C, address the comments in Woodward and Curran's memo dated 6-27-19. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. 
Three, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? All in favor? I'm sure that's unanimous. Congratulations. Good luck. Next item on the agenda is Central Maine Power Company requests a site plan review for 35 Broad Turn Road, Assessor's Map R47, Lot 8B. Uh, right before I turn this over to Jamel, I just want to make one last housekeeping note. Item 17, if you were here for this, item 17, ENF LLC requests a site plan amendment for 371 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 46A. If that is something you are here for, the applicant has requested to, to be tabled, so we will not be hearing that tonight. Okay. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project is located in the VR2 zoning district uh, along Broad Turn Road. So the applicant's proposing a new substation facility uh, comprised of so a crushed stone yard, a single story control house, a transformer, and associated electrical components. Uh, so the sanitary district has a pump house along the southern, southern portion of the property. Uh, staff has recommended the applicant eliminate the existing access to the pump house along Broad Turn Road and provide a new access along the proposed gravel driveway. This would help to eliminate turning movements on Broad Turn Road. Staff would also like to point out that the majority of the proposed light fixtures appear to be full cut off as required. However, the applicant is proposing to install some working yard lights that do not appear to be full cut off. So the board should provide direction to staff and the applicant if you are comfortable with the non cut off fixtures, given they will be used infrequently on the site. And now we'll ask Angela to provide some additional comments. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out in the staff memo, we talk about um, that the town has recently put in a lot of effort, time, and money into developing a Phillips Brook watershed management plan. And essentially, this is um, it identifies the impairments. This is an urban impaired stream that this is with actually just next to. Um, and it, so basically the plan that we have put together identifies a roadmap getting us just to steps towards making this a healthier stream in the watershed improving the watershed and so um what we have what i've listed out in bullets is actually from the watershed management plan and we're looking um recommending that for this project we look at some specific things out of that plan which I've bulleted out, um, I guess, five things. Um, the setback to the streams at 75 feet, um, the preservation of the floodplain and minimizing the wetland impacts, that's very crucial for this watershed in particular, um, the reduction of the impervious area. Essentially, once a watershed reaches 10% impervious area, you start to see a decline in the um, health of the stream. We are at that tipping point in this. We're at 11%. So this is a savable stream is kind of why we put a lot of effort into this watershed in particular, because we can see um, with, with any kind of improvements, it, it could, you could re bring it back. And I think that's really essential in this watershed. Um, another big thing was a lot of undersized culverts within this watershed. DEP looks at essentially the width of the stream when you start looking at stream crossings and replacement or um, adding new stream crossings. Our um, plan recommends 1.2 times that um, because essentially right now our plan for implementation is replacing essentially every stream crossing in this brook um, just to try to get that back. And then the, the last thing I wanted to mention was um, the sediment transport. There's some natural movement of soils and sediment through a stream. This watershed has um, a lot more than a typical. And so I just wanted to point out um, that this site in particular has a gravel driveway, which might be pro problematic. And so there might be opportunities to look at other materials like reclaim or other items um, that could make that a little stabler. That's all. So those are the recommendations that are laid out in staff's comments, and it was just an opportunity to kind of have a conversation with a developer and, and kind of walk through what opportunities we have to try to get closer to, I think, the goals that the town has set. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. Appreciate it. Thanks. So for the applicant, just introduce yourself on the project, please. 
My name is James Morin. I'm with Burns and McDonald. Um, I'm here representing Central Mayor Power. I also have um, some people with me, Daryl Speed, who's uh, with Labella, who's representing Central Mayor Power. And I also have uh, Robin Reed with Burns and McDonald, who's our engineer who worked on this project. So um, I'd be happy to go over, kind of do a review of the project uh, prior. Um, a lot of it would be somewhat repetitive of what Jamel stated. Um, I can do that if you like, or we can move right to the comments, uh, considering the um, lengthy agenda you folks have before you. So um, we can go right to the comments <coughs> if you prefer. I think if you could just do a quick over sure. oversight and then right into the main elements of the comment section. Yeah, understood. So, Central Main Power, as you said, is proposing uh, to construct a new modern 34.5 kV substation facility on a portion of uh, 3.75 acres of vacant land on 35 Broad Turner Road in Scarborough. Uh, the property is bounded to the east by an existing 34.5 kV transmission line that will interconnect via a tap line with the new substation. Uh, an approved parcel. Uh, with a residential dwelling abuts the property to the west, while north of the property currently is vacant forest land. South of the property, as was indicated, was a pump house for the Scarborough Sanitary District. Uh, the new substation will be constructed to current CMP standards and will replace an existing antiquated substation um, at 645 US Route 1 in Scarborough. Uh, the new substation, as indicated, will be outfitted with technology, infrastructure, and corresponding updates uh, that will include a 34.5 12 kV transformer on a foundation with oil containment, line and transformer breakers on foundations, switches, overhead electrical bus, insulators, lighting mass, yard lights, and a new control house. These upgrades will increase the reliability, sustainability, remote monitoring, capability, and operability of the associated electrical transmission grid. Um, can now um, go over the comments. Um, I can start with the uh, peer review comments um, by Wooden and Curran. Um, I can read the comments and then uh, we've gone through all of them and prepared a statement on each of them and uh, I'll read the statement and then we can have some discussion if need be. I think for purposes of just kind of fostering this along, the Really what you um, want to seek from us this evening is anything that you would consider uh, directional from this planning board. You know, if there's path A or path B, you want to be talking to us about some of those issues. Okay. Any issues you've seen come up in staff comments or peer review that, that you might take issue with. Okay. So if you think you can rectify it on your own with the, um, with the planning department some other place, some other time down the road. Understood. We don't need to, we don't need to go over it. So. We're going to need to go over all of them. Okay. Right, just the ones that I think that you find, you want to highlight for us that you could use some guidance on. Okay. Maybe we don't see eye to eye with the town. Okay. Um, that would probably be uh, the, the best use of the board and your time as well. Okay, understood. Um, let me see if I can go through these quickly. Um, one comment, um, the staff comment number two um, was there appears to be a pump house for the Scarborough Sanitary District along the southern portion of the property. The pump house currently is, has direct access to Broad Turn. The staff comments that the applicant eliminate the existing access to the pump house along Broad Turn Road and provide access along the proposed gravel driveway. Uh, this would help eliminate turning movements along Broad Turn Road and the applicant should be prepared to discuss with, with the board. Um, so CMP feels that, you know, outside of the construction, uh, routine maintenance and uh, emergency situations where there'll be minimal traffic from CMP personnel into the substation. Um, to eliminate non-CMP traffic, CMP gates the substation's access road at the access point of Broad Turn Road. And for these reasons, CMP uh, would rather keep the substation access completely separate from the pump house access. I 
know the board was originally wanted to discuss the option of combining the two, but we don't feel that it would be necessary. Okay, all right, very good. Sure. Um, in regards to the um, Phillipsburg watershed, um, the substations, I can read the comment if, to, to stage it first, and then I'll give the, our response. So, um, the project is located within Phillipsburg watershed. This water course has been listed as an urban impaired stream by the main DEP. Both the town of Scarborough and the main DEP has put time, money, and resources towards identifying the specific impairments uh, and creating a framework to restore the stream. The Phillipsburg Watershed Management Plan outlines many measures and opportunities for development to preserve the project, uh, this natural resource, preserve and protect this natural resource. The applicant should review the Watershed Management Plan to consider the following measures, as Angela indicated earlier. The preservation of a 75 foot setback to the stream. The applicant should consider avoiding disturbance within the setback area in order to maintain the existing natural buffer. So the substation's design with regard to the property boundaries and the site topography do not allow the limits of disturbance to be outside of that 75 foot resource setback. Relocating the substation's footprint further away from the stream would likely result in the need for retaining walls and significant cutting in the northwest corner of the property. In addition, the re relocation would impact the access road approach and maneuverability of a mobile transformer, which is a critical piece of the equipment. Now with regards to minimization of wetland impact, the wetland associated with the stream plays a vital part in the path, in the health of the stream and floodplain. It appears that not all the proposed disturbs that are located within wetland areas have been calculated in the total wetland impact of the site. The applicant should consider whether the layout and grading of the site to minimize all impacts, especially adjacent to Phyllis Brook and the tributary stream. So all of the proposed disturbed area within the wetlands were accounted for in the original site uh, plan set. It appears, excuse me, there may have been some confusion in regard to the location of the existing wetland. As the existing wetland hatch markings was similar to the proposed vegetative buffer hatch. In response to the next portion of the comment, the access drive width has been reduced and results in a reduction of proposed wetland impacts from 4,062 square feet to 3,862 square feet. The plans will be revised and will be provided to the uh, Scarborough Planning Board. And with regards to the reduction of the impervious area, the applicant should consider the maximum width necessary for the access drive uh, and consider reductions. So as I indicated earlier, upon further review, the width of the proposed access drive has been reduced from 20 feet to 15 feet. And the plans uh, in the stormwater management study have been revised and will be provided to the Scarborough Planning Board. I think the other issue was uh, the increased stream uh, crossing to a maximum of 1.2 uh, times bank full width. And as you indicated, it's not clear whether the measurements of the bank width has been measured for the sizing of the stream crossing. Undersized culverts are a major contributing factor to erosion within the watershed. In many cases, two times bank full width should be considered. So the original 14-foot span culvert was sized in accordance with the culvert size for stream crossings, 3x rule, and the culvert diameter given in inches, which is the table provided by Main DEP at our pre-application meeting. Field and survey measurements were taken in the area of the proposed crossing, as summarized in the stormwater management study. The culvert was upsized to 20-foot span to provide 1.7 times the bank full width, which exceeds the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers crossing standard of 1.2 times the bank full width. And the last issue that was brought up was the sediment transport, which is a major contributing factor to the impairment of Phillips Brook. The designer should consider the construction of the access drive so that it, the loss of gravel and sediment from non-paved areas will, no further, will not further impact the stream. So upon further review, uh, the construction of the proposed access drive has been changed from gravel to asphalt pavement. The plans in the stormwater management study have been revised and will, provide, will be provided to the Scarborough Planning Board. So the next issue of question was the, uh, the lighting. And as the Scarborough Planning Board staff comments indicated, uh, in accordance with section 
Four H three in the site plan review ordinance, cutoff light fixtures shall be used to control glare, sky glow, and spillover onto adjacent properties. It appears that a majority of the light fixtures proposed are full cutoff. However, the applicant is proposing to install working yard lights that will be used occasionally for maintenance and operation purposes. These lights are flood type fixtures and are not full cutoff. The board should provide direction to staff and the applicant if they are comfortable with the proposed working yard lights given they will be used infrequently on the site. So the comment about the working yard lights um, is correct. These lights are only used in emergency uh, maintenance situations. They are turned on manually and will not be used continually. Um, number five uh, of the staff comments, the applicant has indicated the existing substation located at 645 US Route 1 will be demolished, uh, decommissioned once the proposed substation goes into service. And the applicant should update the board onto their plans to restore the site once the decommissioning has taken place. So with regard to that site, all electrical equipment, support structures, and security fencing will be removed and the site will be brought back to natural grade and revegetated once the new substation is fully commissioned and energized. If decommissioning of the old substation is done during the winter months, final restoration will be completed once weather is acceptable for seeding and new vegetation. Um, regarding staff comment number eight, um, public and private utilities, staff was able to find a detail of the proposed fencing surrounding the substation. Staff recommends that the applicant provide a stockade or vinyl fence design instead of a chain link fence. The applicant should be prepared to discuss this with the board. So CMP does not use privacy fencing for two reasons, security and safety. If a person was able to enter the substation compound inside the fence yard, unauthorized, then the privacy screening would allow them to go on scene. In addition, this would lead to a potential safety situation due to the high voltage conditions present. CMP, CMP believes that the current landscaping plan provides adequate screening for the substation. I think that may address all the discussion points. I think the other points that were brought up in the peer review member memo um, were just things that the they picked up and maybe what the board asked to see on the site plans, which we will incorporate. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, and just to uh, quickly just try to summarize, so uh, as it relates to the Philip Brooks watershed, um, from what I heard, I said, the 75 foot stream setback going to be met? Will be, I'm sorry. Will it be met? The, the, 75, 70, the foot 75 foot setback will not be met. It will not be met. And that is, um, and Angela or Jamel, if you could please just assist me with this. The 75, is that an, a zoning requirement or is this a Phillips Watershed Protection Management Ordinance new right. regulation? Um, it is not an ordinance. It is in the watershed management plan. Um, and then I think in the ordinance to talk about, you look at stream setbacks, but you try to minimize within that. And so DEP regulates within 25 feet. So that other 50 feet is where we look at minimizing and inland fishery and wildlife usually chimes in with that as well. Um, so that's usually where we look at, are there opportunities to try to, um, to give a larger buffer, even in a nor even in any watershed, I will say. And just as a follow-up question, is the rear of your building pretty much along? It, it seems to me like you have some space there on the setback side that you still have a little distance there that on on the if the need rear, be, the yeah. rear setback is that what you're on the rear setback, correct? Um, if we do it. It's not going to account for this for the additional 50 feet. Um, I don't believe we have much. It's 50 feet just to the nearest corner of the stream. Is it? Am I looking? If I look at the, I guess southeast corner of the building, is it? That's is that the closest point to the stream? 
Well, it would be the, the driveway and the limits of disturbance would be within the 75 foot. So the, the limits of disturbance are outside the 25 foot, but within the 75 foot. So I think it's more than just the, uh, the building and the compound, it's the access way. Uh, and so the limits of disturbance would be within that 75 feet. Is that, am I answering so, your question? Am I so not? for the, when you say the, you're not talking about the actual driveway, you're actually talking about the, what I'll call a parking area, is that? It's more of a turn, yeah, it's a turnaround. That's, that's what's within the 75, that's, that's closer than 75 feet is what you're saying. I believe so, yeah. The, the 75 foot line is, you can see um, along the uh, western boundary, you can see those dashed lines. Um, that's the, right there is a 25 foot, I believe, and the next one above is the 75. That is the 70, okay. Is that, if that's Thank how you. it's labeled. So. so a portion of it does hit the front corner of the building. I guess my, my question for you would have been, it, it doesn't appear like it takes a whole lot extra room to just push that building back 10 feet. Uh, not thinking about the turnaround area, right? but the actual building itself. And I'm not sure if Angela, that even jives with any of the intent of that management plan. Is it the intent to get that whole drive area off of that 75 foot? I think um, the, the recommendation is to look at it and see how far you can, how much can you give us? Um, obviously the recommendation is 75 and, and obviously there's issues with that, but is there some middle ground? And looking at say the under drain soil filter in that placement, um, I don't know, it just seemed like there, there might be some opportunity. And like you said, I think when you're looking at the yard itself where the fence is, is there opportunity to pull anything that we can away from that stream or even look at enhancing the buffer um, if you can't get out That's of the buffer. Okay. Might be another option to discuss. Okay. And uh, just out of curiosity, is the applicant initial thoughts on, on the options there? Um, I think getting it be out of the 75 foot, um, as I indicated earlier, is just the, what it would take to put in the retaining walls, as well as to bring in the turning radiuses for a mobile transformer. I, it's just, it wouldn't be possible to get it outside the 75 foot. It, 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 the dominoes don't line up to where it, it would be feasible for the substation and what's needed for the components of the substation. Go ahead, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, please come up to the podium and just introduce yourself. And... Hello, I'm Daryl Speed. I'm the project manager for this project for CMP. Um, you had mentioned about enhancing the buffer as an option. I think that's something we definitely would look into. Um, if it means that we don't have to move the substation because there's a lot that goes into moving that further back away than just moving it. Um, but enhancing the buffer is definitely something we'd be interested in talking about and looking into further with you. Thank you, yeah. appreciate it. Um, all right, I think I've got relative clarity here on the next points. Before we get any further into it though, this is a, uh, an opportunity for public comment. If there's anyone here that wanted to speak on this issue, just have you approach the podium. Give us your thoughts, your name, your address. Yep. All right, I'll close public comments. Um, so from the rest of um, what we heard here, and correct me please if I'm wrong, anyone. Um, it sounds to me like the, uh, anything else listed in this Philip Brook watershed, these bullets, it sounds like you've made an attempt to address, um, which, you know, moving, you know, the 20 foot pave width to 15, going to, if I understood correctly, a 1.7 bank full width instead of, um, you know, the 1.2. So uh, that seems to exceed. Um, and then I have asphalt instead of the gravel to reduce the sediment that's gonna be lost. So it seems to me like you've at least willing to make some changes in this plan and have a plan going forward and to address a lot of those issues that of course concern us all. Um, for the First uh, item, I do have a question for staff. Um, not to put you on the spot, do you believe a gate 
<clears throat> um, the installation of a gate along that broad turn drive is effective for um, our purposes here? Uh, unsure without seeing the gate. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, you know, behind our comment, what, what we were really thinking is even if there isn't a lot of traffic coming in and out, it's still a place for someone to turn around and potentially create an unsafe situation. Um, it's a pretty, I think it's 35 miles an hour, but it certainly isn't driven that way. Um, so that's, that's where that was coming from. Okay. And then, um, you know, for as far as the safety fence, um, your reasoning is probably the best reason to not install a privacy fence <laughs> that I've ever heard here. So kudos to you. Um, <laughs> it makes sense. So, um, all right. So that's my piece, guys. I, I jumped in first. Um, Rachel. Yeah, I, I have a question uh, for Angela or Jamel, and, and that is on that pumping station. Does the pumping station have currently have a driveway that accesses broad turn? All right, what, yes. Yes, what would be the space, the distance between that driveway and the proposed driveway for the CMP facility? Hard to tell, but it looks like maybe 10 feet. 15 feet? I don't know if you guys can answer that. I don't. It appears to be pretty close. I'm concerned about two driveways is as little as they're likely to be used, but two driveways onto Broad Turn Road within 10 feet of each other, or 15 feet even. Um, I, I guess I, I don't see why it's not possible to somehow or other merge those driveways to ensure that there is only one. And as you talk about an access gate, since it's not here on the plans, it's tough for me to figure out uh, how that would work or how that access gate works. I, we could, the staff would like to point out there is driveway separation standards. Um, so it, it looks like that would require a waiver um, based on the speed limit. What would be the separate, what is the uh, driveway separation standards? Uh, for uh, 35, I believe it's, I'd have to look at the ordinance, but I think it's 100 feet. Um, but I can take a peek right now. All right, so we have a problem then with an ordinance uh, with those two, two facilities right next to each other. Uh, and it makes sense for you folks to reconsider uh, a way to link those two facilities given especially the traffic on Broad Turn Road. I'm with uh, whoever said it that while the speed limit may be something, that's not how people travel along that road. Um, so the more we can look after the safety by linking those two, I think the better off um, both uh, Sanitary District and uh, CMP would be along there. Um, do you, I'd like to see a different fence other than a, a, a chain link, and I, I understand the, the concept of um, the need to be able to look in there to make sure that there is no mischief going on. Um, I would love to see an alternative, uh, somebody taking a look at what some of the other options are. It doesn't have to be a closed stockade fence. Uh, full closed, um, but it also doesn't, I would hope, have to be a chain link fence. Roger. Um, regarding the pump station, I a question for staff. Do you happen to know whether the, uh, there's a fence there, a gate, a gate, going to the pump station? Yeah. There is? No. There isn't. Like oh, you just... Um, I'm not hung up on that issue as much as maybe my colleagues are because I don't think either of these facilities are going to be used that often. I understand the concern about the turnaround, but I, I imagine your fence, your gate's going to be right next to Broad Turn Road. Is that correct? At least it tried to. Within whatever the ordinances are, which I don't know off the top of my head, but it'll but be you're going to be as close to Broad Turn as you yep. can get. Okay. Yep. Um, I, I just don't think this is. I understand the the ordinance and all this other the other 
plans and everything, but I, I don't think this is going to be that big an issue myself. I, regarding the fence, I don't think anybody, personally, I don't think anybody's going to notice this place as they drive along Broad Turn Road. It's going to be back that far enough you know, from the road. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you on your security issue. And um, so in this case, I don't have a problem with a chain link fence. Um, the, the question on the, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see if you can actually move the building, if that makes any sense to do that. You know, my question maybe to Angela is, I know they're going to uh, pave the driveway leading into it. What about the parking area? Could that be some sort of pervious material to, instead of paved, mm -hmm. to help alleviate this issue a little bit? Roger, you're talking like a stormwater engineer over there. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm actually channeling uh, Ro uh, Robin. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's there's opportunities for um, yeah, a porous wood pavement with anything. I mean, there's lots of different um, BMPs they could do in that area. Um, obviously, they have to maintain it in the winter, so they'll be plowing over it. So that would have to be part of the consideration on what they could maintain. But there's there's options you could look at. Yep. Okay. The um, and then <clears throat> on the um, the working yard lights, are those? Um, what I'm familiar with these yard lights and they're on utility poles, and so they're going to be high up. Um, is there any way of lowering those to to still serve your purposes without being the height of like a regular street light? Off the top of my head, I don't think so. I mean, it's a standard for CMP at, uh, at the height that we use for these working lights for you know emergency situations. Yeah. I'm willing to look into it, you know, as a as a suggestion, but I don't think so. Okay. No. Um, all right, I'll leave. I'll leave the rest for my colleagues. <laughs> Jenna Rick, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I have a couple of questions. I would be also supportive of um, further investigating the combination of those driveways um, and also curious to see where you would place a security fence. Um, it seems like there would probably be room to do that in a way that could facilitate access to the pump station property in addition to providing the security to your driveway that you would need. Um, also on on the lights, based on other facilities that you have, how frequently do you think that you would use um, lighting like that? Honestly, hopefully never. They're only for emergency pe purposes. You know, regular maintenance will be done during the day. Mm -hmm. You know, and the emergency situation is getting people's lights back on. Sure. So it's pretty much all, you know, all hands on deck. And they light it up so they can see and work safely. appreciate your um, reducing the driveway width and um, being sensitive to the material that you're choosing. Just a question on the, um, the stormwater treatment, the, the soil filter that you have. It does look like a, a significant portion of that area is falling within the 75 foot setback um, for the stream. And I know that we know that it's difficult to site sort of the rest of you, you probably started with citing the rest of your, you know, the substation itself and the rest of that pad. Um, but curious if you could provide a little more input on how you ended up locating the soil filter itself within that buffer area and what alternatives you might have considered for locating it elsewhere. I'm going to call a friend sure. on this one. <laughs> Uh, Robin Reed with Burns and McDonnell, um, the stormwater engineer on this project. Um, just to give a little bit of feedback on the location of the grass under drain soil filter, um, at first we had cited it kind of in that southeast corner to capture as much of the runoff from the substation pad as possible. Uh, we've got the system draining um, from west to east kind of across the yard. 
The other constraint that we had was just north of the underground, of the filter, we've got overhead lines coming into the station. And while those lines are about 30 feet in the air, we did want to try to limit um, the amount of work that may need to happen to maintain that basin to be out from, you know, underneath the overhead lines. And those, is that, that's shown on your plan with the dashed, sort of the dashed line there, is that right? Right, so there's an existing dash line that runs um, north to south, and then if you look, there's a dark kind of a boxy structure on the east side of the yard. That's where the lines actually connect from the existing line into the yard. Um, should be a few plans in, there's a site location plan, but the, the proposed lines are not shown on this plan, but they connect from the existing into the yard just above that filter. And do those have the same clearance, the proposed lines? They do, yes. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Rick, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I'm okay with the, the big floodlights. I think they're not going to be on that much. Uh, so in the height of those, uh, you know, probably I would err to the safety of the workers in there versus having the height because you don't want to mess with 37K. Um, there is about 150 feet of frontage on broad turn from the driveway of the pump house to the, to the uh, property line. And if they were going to use the driveway of the pump house, they're actually probably going to have to widen that a little bit, which would get closer to the brook. Uh, I can't imagine a big CMP, you know, deuce and deuce and a half driving in front of that pump house to align with a road to get in there. I think they'd have to widen it. So I think their approach of trying to find a good spot for that entryway um, would probably be a better solution. That's all I have. Thank you, Rick. Can I address, can I address him, that yes. comment? My, we have thought about it, and what we, we were thinking if we do end up doing this is we'll leave our driveway as it is and have yours come you know, essentially parallel to Broad Turn Road into the pump house. So that would be the main entrance okay. and potentially push our gate further back you know, up towards the substation. That way, you know, you got that your water district wouldn't need to have a key to get in. It would just, you know, be perpendicular right. to ours. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I, actually, I think that's a good, a good solution. I, as I was looking at this, um, I, I realized it's not going to be used often, um, but it's very likely at some point to be used during a snowstorm. And where are you going to put the snow? How are you going to handle this driveway and plowing to move the snow without um, encroaching on some wetlands? I mean, what, what, what are your plans? Uh, the plans would be good. You want to put okay. Depending on the se severity of the snowfall, snowfall we typically would be able to do a shot straight up through from Broad Turn Road to the substation and keep the snow on our parking, use the word parking area loosely, but then the snow internal to the, because we also plow inside the substation, is kept internal to the substation. We plow it off to the sides, it okay. stays in the substation. Now, if it's a really bad storm, it may, they may not be able to go straight through, but you know, our, our operator, operators have pretty large trucks and the ones they use with the plows. We plow it ourselves, you know, with our substation staff. So the, the storage would be um, looking at the, the plan, uh, the site plan. Um, it would be off to my right. Yep. Uh, that in little that, parking in area. In that, that parking yeah. area. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's, yeah. I I have, know I that. We have a very similar, much, even longer driveway down in, in uh, Berwick. And we go straight shot unless it's a really bad snowstorm. Go right straight up to the snow, up to the uh, substation. Thank you. Thank you. So, with that, um, does the applicant have any? Uh, do you feel you have a good handle on what you need to be doing for your next visit? Yes. Okay. I, I, staff. Does do staff have anything that they need more clarification on? No. Okay. 
Go ahead. I do just do have one comment or question or conversation. With combining the two driveways, you know, CMP needs the to back in and back down the road. I don't know what requirements the uh, the sanitary district would be, and they it, it's going to create an extra wiggle to get from our driveway over to their property and then to into the pump house. So depending on what the sanitary district's interests are, um, they may require something to be at a 90 degree off a of broad turn, similar to what CMP. It's just a, just a thought. I don't, I, can I, I don't know the answer to that. Just I can speak to that. Um, during our <coughs> staff review meeting, the sanitary district was there and they were open to the to discussion. Um, they just asked you ask the applicant to contact them and start working out the details. So understood. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. See you next time. Next item on the agenda is Kathleen Bailey requests a preliminary subdivision review for 27 Ross Road, Assessor's Map R86, Lot 1. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project's located in the R2 uh, zoning district along Ross Road. Um, the applicant's proposing an 11 lot conventional residential subdivision to be served by a public road. So the applicant's in front of the board tonight for a preliminary review. So as requested by the board, a wetland peer review was conducted on this, completed on the site uh, this past spring. The consultant also concluded that less than one acre of wetlands are located on the property and therefore a conservation subdivision design is not required. So the applicant has provided a split rail fence along the upland edge of the wetlands on lots one and two to ensure they are not impacted by the development. Uh, staff recommends that the applicant extend this protection along the entire edge of the wetlands on the site, on the lots. Step also continues to recommend that the applicant consider uh, reducing the sides of lot, sizes of lot one, two, and seven, as this could result in additional buffering to the wetlands. Uh, the board should be sure to weigh in on the need for uh, light fixtures along Bailey Hill Road, uh, given the curve and the design. And the applicant has requested a waiver uh, for the sidewalk requirement, uh, but staff recommends uh, one be provided to promote walkability uh, for the residents. And then the applicant has indicated they are increasing stormwater flow uh, from the site and staff recommends they work with staff um, to evaluate opportunities to reduce peak flow rates. I'll turn it back to you at this point. Thank you very much. If you could just do a brief overview that we have seen this before and we get to assume that we've read these materials. So yep, just a um, quick highlight and then uh, the, big, the big points. Yes, uh, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Travis Letelier. I'm here from Northeast Civil Solutions representing uh, Kathleen Bailey with their uh, subdivision, with her subdivision uh, proposal. Um, as far as any, uh, I think Jamel covered it pretty thoroughly, but as far as some of the points I'd like to go over with, uh, with the sidewalk, um, we're, we're requesting the waiver um, from sidewalk due to the sort of rural nature, uh, rural location of this of this subdivision. Um, it's also would be uh, Ross Road also doesn't include a uh, sidewalk, so it would be connecting into basically nothing, and it also wouldn't be connecting to any uh, open space. Um, as far as the size of the lots, um, we feel that. Uh, Reducing the size of the lots would create sort of an awkward uh, open space situation in the back of, of lots one and two where it was suggested. Um, and at this time it would be, we're gonna keep, uh, propose the, the condition as it is. Um, uh, as, as with lighting, um, we are amenable to the, to the light at the, at the intersection, but we, we do, asked to get your opinion on the lighting uh, along the road and, and uh, we don't feel that it is also necessary due to the rural nature of the, of the subdivision. Um, with that, I think that's the, the, the high points and I open to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone that would like to speak, please just approach the podium, state your name and your address for the record. Hi, my name's Don Hamill. Uh, I'm a counselor uh, in Scarborough, but I'm speaking this evening as a, 
as a private citizen and a resident of Pine Point. Uh, so I know that this has been under consideration for some time and the reference was made at the beginning about uh, uh, a review of the wetlands. Um, the question I had is if you view this proposed subdivision as an overlay of the, the broader property, uh, and then this may uh, be an issue that's no longer has any bearing, but there was a significant um, uh, series of issues uh, going back to September 2016 that required uh, under the terms of a consent decree uh, that there would be major restoration and mitigation measures, you know, in the area immediately adjacent to the proposed subdivision. So, you know, my, I have three questions really, and I won't go through all the detail, but at that time, it, uh, this was something that was basically, uh, uh, that also required enforceable conservation easements and so forth. So my first question is, what, what is the status? I mean, is that uh, consent decree of uh, you know, not more than three years ago, has that been fully fulfilled? Has that been complied with completely, uh, number one? Uh, number two, the, as I referenced a, a moment ago, uh, the decree required extensive preservation areas to be created, actually five of them uh, to be precise, you know, on this side of the Ross Road, actually, uh, and two of them, uh, according to, you know, just maps that I've looked at and Google Maps and so forth, uh, but uh, either side of the Ross Road, there were additionally um, conservation easements that were required across the street at uh, the campgrounds. The, thir the third question I have is, uh, considering uh, how fragile this area is and uh, all of the concerns that we have are uh, growing concerns about stormwater drainage and uh, proximity to the marsh and and other areas. Um, if this is something that's, if this is a, uh, is a development that is deemed appropriate by the planning board, wouldn't it make sense for there to be a requirement to, to have sewers put in in this area rather than um, uh, the traditional approach uh, to RF zones, which may not require that? So I know it's not a Q&A session, but these are questions that I had, uh, you know, with a preliminary review, and, and it did seem to me that these are things that I'm not sure have been uh, discussed or vetted thoroughly. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to comment on this? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, Jim Mel, do you have... Any information for us, perhaps? On the consent agreement? Yes. Um, so that was actually provided during sketch plan. Um, so I'd ask the applicant actually to uh, provide answers to, to those questions. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and uh, with the previous submission, I did uh, actually include one full uh, printout of that dissent, of consent decree um, showing uh, various maps uh, of, of the area of concern, uh, which are uh, not inclusive of, of this portion of the property. It's actually, it's, it's outside of the area that uh, the EPA has concerns with. Um, as far as complying with, with the degree, I'd have to get back to you on where, where they are in the process with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rachel, do you want to start this one? Not really. <laughs> Now I'm confused, but um, yes, certainly. Um, I, I want to address a, a couple of things, and, and that is uh, the need for the lights along the Bailey Hill Road, um, and also, I believe, the need for, for a sidewalk. When you're selling lots to families to build family homes, you're going to have um, children. You're going to have parents with children. You are going to have people who want to walk down a sidewalk rather than the middle of the road. Um, you're going to have elderly who are going to be doing some power walking down there. Uh, and to me, a sidewalk is a, a real amenity uh, and important. And I understand that um, this is, as you say, perhaps a more rural area. But an awful lot of rural areas in Scarborough are now becoming much more um, built up and places for families uh, much more suburban. 
I, and I see this as that sort of a development. It is not a conservation um, development. It is, it looks like, for families uh, with an opportunity to use the road as an amenity and as, as some open space. So I think um, the light, perhaps at the curve uh, on Bailey Hill, and a sidewalk would be very appropriate. So I would not be inclined to give a waiver on that. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Roger. Um, do you know, maybe staff knows, Angela, um, are there sewers on uh, Ross Road? There's no sewers on Ross Road, right? I am not aware. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, that really not much of an option then. About how far it would be from? Yeah. Um, I have. I can. We can look into that. I can pull it up. And get back to you. Okay. Um, um, I'll just I'll just deal with some easy ones then for for the time being. Um, the um, what about the um, the staff's recommendation for a split rail fence along lots one and two? We did provide that in the, the last submission, and it was a, suggested that we extend it a little bit further, yeah. and we have no problem with okay, that. Okay, all right. Um, on the street lighting, um, I, can, I can actually see where it might make some sense for you to consider. I, I believe staff is talking about the curve, and yes. um, you might want to consider a couple there, you know, but I, you know, I, don't, I don't know. It's... I'm kind of in, you know, indifferent towards that. I, I, I can see where it would make some sense. I'm torn about the sidewalks. I live in a neighborhood without sidewalks, but I can, I can also see the argument where it enhances the value of the property when there's sidewalks in a neighborhood. Um, so I, I could almost go either way on that. Um, and the other thing, I, I guess there's no more easy ones for me. That's it. You're all set. Yeah, I'm all set. Jen. Um, okay, I, um, I'm going over my notes. Okay, so, I would be supportive of um, extending the fence along the full limit of the um, the wetlands, particularly, you know, I think to protect that from construction activity, but also, you know, in the future, sometimes wetlands look like wetlands and sometimes they don't. That would just be another sort of visual cue to um, private property owners that this is perhaps an area that they shouldn't be um, treating in the same way as not wetlands. Um, <clears throat> on the sidewalk issue. Um, so I so it looks as though you're not proposing any curbing, correct? No, we're gonna be collecting stormwater with ditches. Uh, ditches, okay. So have you given thought, let's see, your initial proposal was to not include sidewalks, correct? correct. You were asking for a waiver correct. from that? Yep. So if you were to include sidewalks, would those be adjacent to your roadway? And it's possible you haven't thought about this because you're seeking a waiver. That can be your answer too. Um, but but if you've given any thought to whether where that sidewalk placement would happen, would it be adjacent to the travelway? Would you then curb? Um, or would you provide some sort of esplanade between grass esplanade between um, the travelway and the sidewalk. I haven't haven't considered it quite yet, but um, uh, we probably would avoid the curbing that would involve extra structures and, sure. and, and <coughs> infrastructure. So, um, if we, if we were allowed to collect stormwater in the in the esplanade or, or some other way, that would be preferable. And you were saying that your rationale for seeking the waiver on the sidewalk was due to the rural character of the subdivision, is that right? Yeah, just the location of the overall subdivision off Ross Road. And are there any, there's no sidewalks anywhere on Ross Road, right? 
Not that I, I don't not that I, I don't saw, so. no. But I do have an answer on sewer. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, uh, 1,400 feet back to Pine Point Road. Is where the, the sewer is in Pine Point Road. Um, so on the, on the issue of the sidewalk, I, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to go in favor of the waiver, um, or to, to ask if the applicant would consider a contribution fee in lieu of constructing the sidewalk, with the idea being that I think, um, you know, we, we have a lot of other pedestrian infrastructure, um, for example, on Pine Point Road, um, that may not necessarily directly tie into this, but that, the, that these folks coming and purchasing these homes could, in theory, go on to use, whether it be close to this site or elsewhere, up, you know, up here in Oak Hill, for example, where, wherever, um, wherever we end up using, using those um, funds and we collect those from other developments as well. Um, but in that, I think there's a little bit of an argument for having a wider street, um, and that would be to sort of facilitate a little bit more of a shared street feel. Um, so not necessarily providing dedicated separate space for pedestrians and for vehicles, noting in both cases that those are going to be very low in this, you know, you've got 11 lots, so presumably, you know, 11 families, um, or other homeowners, the you know it's just it, it, it shouldn't be all that busy, um, and I think that um, you know if if adequate space were provided in the roadway to sort of um, encourage some of that shared space use, that we may it may not warrant dedicated facilities for each. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and I think that's it. That's what I have. Thank you, Jen. Rick? For me, I think it's one or the other. Um, give us a sidewalk so that it's marked where people can go visit their neighbors and then leave and feel like they have a pathway to get to their house. Um, or if you don't put a sidewalk, then we need lights so they can at least see uh, in that direction. So. One or the other with me. That's me. Thank you. Um, so I'll weigh in. I, I agree that there should be some uh, lighting, especially around that corner. Um, living on a road that has one of these types of corners, mm -hmm. it's, it's constantly a concern. Um, make sure that there is proper lighting at night, and especially in these nice family type neighborhood settings. There will be kids at play and families walking even past dark. So. Um, I think a light, at least in that area, is, is important to it. Um, as for the sidewalks, what I'd really like to see happen is if you, if you don't want to do them internally into the development, which I would, I would understand, it's probably going to be a very quiet street. Um, I, I would like to see that contribution to the multimodal account. Um, being as close as you are to Blue Point Road, um, I think at some point down the road, it would not surprise me to see foot traffic leaving this development to kind of head that way. Um, there's mm -hmm. plenty to do and see there, and you're less than a quarter of a mile away from it. So mm -hmm. uh, perhaps that, that might be the better solution. I'm okay with your waiver request uh, for a smaller street streetway, 22 feet. Uh, and uh, the rest of it, I think you've covered, and I think this board is covered. Uh, if I have left anything else out, no. Um, with those notes, though, you're, you're pretty close to... Um, you're about ready for a preliminary, I think. I think you have a lot of touch-up, not a lot, but some touch-up to do, um, figure in some of these bigger things, but I think we can review those details at the next step. Okay. So with that said, um, I'm willing to put forward a motion to uh, approve the preliminary subdivision for 27 Ross Road, uh, Assessor's Map, R86, Lot 1. Second. And a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Should preliminary approval. Uh, we'll see you next time around. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> All right. 
Next item on the agenda is Roger Hale requests a final subdivision review for 263 Broad Turn Road Assessor's Map R8, Lot 13. Jamil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's been a few months since you guys have seen this one. I believe you were granted preliminary approval in January. Um, as a reminder, it's in the RF district. It's a nine lot residential conservation subdivision uh, served by a public street. And I'm gonna keep it short. Uh, staff is generally comfortable uh, with the proposed design and has provided the board with a motion with conditions for your consideration. Leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Jason Haskell with DM Roma Consulting Engineers here for uh, Roger Hale on his Peaceful Acres uh, property. Um, as Jamel said, it's a nine lot conservation subdivision. We're looking uh, eventually for uh, town acceptance of the roadway as a public road. Uh, we're also proposing a 10,000 gallon fire tank, which has been reviewed by the uh, captain. And uh, we're showing two street, pre street trees per lot, and we're gonna be setting them off the road a little bit more than what we're showing right now. Um, over the past few months, we have been working through the details with DEP. And through that process, we've changed the, the pond design slightly, well, completely, <laughs> now that I say that. Um, but we've worked through all the kinks, and we finally did receive the stormwater permit from the DEP. Um, we did receive the comments from Jamel and from the, uh, the, peer, the traffic peer review engineer um, related to some minor changes to the uh, plans and to the draft homeowners association documents, but we're hoping tonight um, that we could get uh, final approval with conditions to address those comments. And uh, thank you, and here for any questions. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this issue? Please approach the podium. Seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. Um, I'm just gonna throw this one out in general because there's very few comments left on this. Does anyone else on the board uh, have anything that they want to add or contribute? Roger. Yes. Um, on the uh, Grove Palmer peer review, the proposed roadway approach to Broad Turn Road is relatively steep. Did you, has that been resolved? Again, I'm speaking as Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can speak to that. Um, we did look at um, Grohl Palmer's comments, and they picked up on something, which we missed. And I think it's something minor enough that I could work with the designer. It's really about modifying the vertical curve as you come into the site. They do have a 2% grade. It's just not quite long enough. And the max is three, so they're under that. It just needs to be stretched out a little bit, which I think we can resolve pretty easily. Yeah, what it, what it ends up doing is it goes into the vertical curve. So it, at that point, it's somewhere around three and a half percent at the 75 foot distance. So, yeah, it ended up at, around four. We, but yeah. we also do want to make sure that this is going to be acceptable for public road acceptance. So, mm -hmm. if, if that's something that Angela's going to be looking for, then we can work that out for sure. Um, that's all I have. I'm just looking forward to seeing this this site built out, <laughs> having been on a site walk. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I, I think we've wrestled it to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With that said, I do have a motion to approve the project titled Peaceful Acre Subdivision proposed by Roger Hale as depicted on the plan set prepared by DM Roma. Dated 6 14 19 with the following findings and conditions. Findings The applicant is proposing a nine lot residential conservation subdivision located at 263 Broad Turn Road. The subdivision is located within the RF zoning district and is further identified in the town of Scarborough tax maps as map R8 lot 13. The planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design on the site plan adequately addresses the requirements of the subdivision and zoning ordinances. Conditions 1. Prior to the signing and release of the Mylar, the plan set shall be revised to address the following. A, street trees shall be located outside of the drainage swales along Peaceful Lane. B, catch basins will be required to be set at binder grade with a detail illustrating the pavement transition. C, a detail for the type one concrete slip form curb on binder pavement shall be added. D, a terminus end detail for the concrete curb shall be added. This, also, this shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. 
Two, prior to the release of the Mylar, the applicant shall A, execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater management ordinance. B, provide a revised homeowners association agreement for planning staff to review and approve. The agreement shall include language explaining the restrictions and allowed uses within the open space. C, coordinate with staff in regards to the fire tank. D, address the traffic peer review comments in the memo dated 6-27-19 from Goral Palmer. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, pay the recreation contribution fee of $250 per lot. C, pay the tree growth penalty fee. Four, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Second. And a second, any discussion? All in favor? Sure, that is unanimous. Good luck. Thank you. All right. All right, so we're going to take a five minute recess because we're about to get into some meaty stuff. So we will return. What is that? Is that your phone?
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for uh, abiding the uh, five-minute recess there. Uh, our next applicant is Crossroad Holdings LLC. Requests a final subdivision plan review as part of a plan development project for the Downs Innovation District, 90 Payne Road, Assessor's Map R52, Lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the board knows, this project is located in the Crossroads Plan Development District, uh, the northerly portion of the Downs property with access off of Payne Road. Uh, so the applicants in front of the board tonight with a final subdivision plan for the entire Phase 2 site that includes a 57 lot light industrial and commercial subdivision. Uh, as indicated in the applicant's memo, uh, the applicant seeking final approval at the July 22nd board meeting is before the board tonight to discuss the remaining any remaining elements identified uh, in the staff and peer review memos. So the applicant has been working with staff and the main DOT over the past few months on the required traffic movement permit uh, for the project. Uh, given that the site, that site plan approvals uh, will be required before any development can take place on the site, uh, staff is actually comfortable with the board granting final approval for this project um, so long as the applicant has their approved TMP in hand prior to future site plan approvals for individual lots. Staff would also like to point out an error in the review comments memo provided to the board and the applicant uh, for this project. The memo states that the off-site street improvements associated with the project will need to be constructed prior to any future site plan submissions. However, staff is comfortable with the off-site improvements being constructed prior to future certificates of occupancy that will be informed by traffic counts to be provided with upcoming site plan submissions for individual lots. Staff continues to recommend uh, that the applicant provide an analysis for the Route 1 Scarborough Downs Road intersection uh, due to its proximity to the development in Phase 1 and any traffic that will be crossing the core uh, coming from Phase 2. The applicant should provide the board on their ongoing coordination with regional tra transit agencies and any provisions such as bus stops and bus shelters throughout the project. And staff also continues to recommend some additional street trees along the western end of Innovation Way. I'll now ask Angela to uh, continue on with staff comments. Thank you. Um, it was noted in the plans the applicant is proposing overhead um, electric throughout all the future public right-of-ways within this phase of the project. And it's not clear during the master plan process um, for this pod where the three-phase electric uh, is proposed, whether it's overhead or underground. And so. Um, staff has discussed this with the design team and, and they have obviously pointed out the difficulties associated with putting three-phase power without using the, knowing the end users for this type of development and the industrial kind of use that they're looking for. So um, staff has discussed it with them and asked for them just to provide a clear plan on where overhead will be going as opposed to underground um, and we should probably be looking at this throughout the phases as we go. Um, this one in particular though being industrial, I think they can make the point um, associated with that three-phase power. So it's just getting a clearer picture of what is proposed. Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. Rocky? Good evening. Uh, Rocky Risperer with Crossroads Holdings LLC. Unfortunately, Dan was called away uh, tonight and can't be here with us. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about what I had planned to talk about, and then I'm going to try to be, pretend to be Dan and get through his notes. Um, I apologize for that in advance. So I want to talk to the board tonight about the Innovation District, um, this light industrial phase of, of the project that we're you know, really excited about. Um, we've had a lot of interest in that, uh, as I've explained in the past, and uh, we're really feeling like we're getting close to, to making something happen here. Um, we've worked pretty hard to address staff comments uh, recently and uh, to try to get to a final plan. Um, our permit status right now is we obviously have a preliminary plan approved by the town. Uh, we got that in April. We got Portland Water District and Sanitary District approvals in May. We have a pending DEP approval. Um, it's expected by July 14th. It was originally expected by June 14th, but they needed a little more time. They're quite short-staffed, and so we're working with them on that. But we expect to have that in hand by July 14th. Um, my goals for tonight uh, would be to try to finalize any loose ends with the board and try to get to a point where uh, we could be a consent item uh, on the meeting of the 22nd, uh, at least uh, to, but at least to hammer out the, the final details uh, that we need to with the board. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about what an approval of the innovation district does. 
Um, what an approval does for us is it creates these 57 commercial and light industrial lots in three phases. It enables on-site infrastructure construction to begin. So we could begin this construction season and get going with the project and building the roads and, and infrastructure to serve the project. It also then allows us to market and, and have lot sales. And uh, we really can't do a whole lot uh, with end users until we have a final approval on the plan. So that's what it does for us. What an approval tonight does not do for us is it does not allow us to build any buildings on any of the site. Um, that would only, could only take place after individual site plan approvals uh, are, are had from the planning board. So I wanted to point out that you know, what, what this does for us and, and, and what it doesn't do for us uh, so that everybody can understand. The timing of the subdivision approval is critical to us uh, so that we can accommodate end users that, that we have in hand that, that have known about the project and are very interested in coming. And then that helps us meet our requirements of our TIF and, and credit enhancement agreement uh, that we have with the town. So um, that's, that's what getting uh, approvals uh, as soon as we can will do for us. Um, Dan had uh, some notes here that he handed to me as he went out the door tonight, and uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go by uh, by his notes. But uh, obviously, we're very excited about the subdivision plans. We've worked hard on them uh, with the staff. Um, I think at this point, the board has heard a lot about the subdivision, the design, the approach. Um, it's a very unique project um, and really geared to hit uh, a market that we we feel is is there uh, and that we can be successful with. Um, in addressing some of the staff uh, comments, I think basically there were five that uh, we felt that the, the board needed to weigh in on. The first one talks about traffic. Um, and regarding the, uh, the DOT permit, um, the permit's in process. It'll be issued at some point, uh, probably in August. Uh, but at this point, it's really not required for us to do uh, what we need to do with the project and, and to get started. Um, is because we need site plan approvals um, for anything we actually build in the project. Once we uh, get to the point where we have end users, we can do traffic counts, we'll know exactly what those users will, uh, will utilize um, and, and what, what we'll need to do for traffic. Um, uh, bear with me a moment. So, on-site improvements, um, Offsite improvements will be done as part of this project. They'll be covered in a uh, letter of credit uh, that will go to the town. So the, the improvements that have to be done uh, will be covered uh, in a letter of credit uh, agreement with the town. Um, another uh, description of the impacts of the Innovation District on the Downs Road and Route 1. Currently, Route 1 intersection of the Downs has a level service A and a B when included with the current residential development underway. Now the phase one is very close to completion and COs will be being issued here in the next uh, four weeks or so. Uh, so there will, be, there will be people using that, the roadway will be open, uh, roadway should be open in about two weeks. Um, so right now we're, we're at a level A, we're gonna go to a level B uh, with phase one and the, um, the Route 1 intersection operates at a high level it will not warrant uh, any improvements associated with the Innovation District. Uh, a very low percentage of the Innovation District traffic will travel through this intersection. Randy's actually here tonight uh, if the board wants to talk about traffic. We did talk about traffic quite a bit at the last meeting. So I think that, uh, that addresses uh, the staff's traffic questions. Um, the staff, we did meet with the staff again this morning and they wanted us to talk a little bit about uh, the utilities and um, how we envision them, uh, not only for this uh, phase of the project, but the project in general. And I think we did talk about that early on. Phase one has overhead power on the main road, and then we drop down underground to feed all of the individual subdivisions. And that's really what we envision happening through the entire project. But specifically, with the uh, Innovation District, um, the main road, the public road, which will be Innovation Way and Center Street, uh, would be overhead, and then we would drop down uh, as we're feeding individual lots. Um, and so that, that's been our intention. It's been on our plans uh, since day one. Um, the staff felt it wasn't super clear, uh, and I guess we agree that it, that it wasn't, so we wanted to uh, address that. But 
in uh, this section of the project especially, uh, we, we need three-phase power. We're bringing three-phase power through the entire project to serve uh, all of the needs that, that may be coming. So in this particular part, we need the three-phase power, and really the best way to do that is, is with the overhead uh, main lines, if you will. Um, uh, I think that addresses the power. Um, street trees. Um, Jamel's got a couple of spots on the plan that he thinks we should have some more street trees, trees and we can, we can work with Nicosito, our landscape architect. I'm sure we can come up with, uh, with some more. There are a few places that are going to be difficult um, due, to, due to grade and wetland, but I think we can get a few more in there. So that seemed like something we could, we could accommodate. Um, another item on the list is mass transit, and this project has been designed for mass transit. Uh, Dan's done a lot of work around this personally. I uh, had a handful of meetings with different providers as well as uh, uh, the main uh, Turnpike Authority. And we've designed the Innovation District to be transit ready with sidewalks, with bike lanes, areas that can be easily accommodate a bus stop. What we don't have is end users at this point. Uh, and that's really something we, we will need to justify transit, uh, any kind of an extension. Uh, we'll also need some help from the town, we think, with some matching funds to do that. But all of that really has to get figured out when we have users and when we have people that are willing to, uh, willing to use the transit. We have plenty of area on site uh, within, the, within the project to accommodate bus shelters uh, as they become necessary. So we intend to, to deal with that as, as demand, uh, as we get demand. Um, Finally, uh, I want to talk about an MOU for public access uh, and use of the uh, Downs Road. Um, we're working with the staff on that. Our attorneys have, have uh, spoken. I think we're pretty close with, with something that will be finalized that the town can live with. But basically, we are uh, setting this up so that um, the, the public will be able to get from the Payne Road to Route 1 during construction uh, in some manner or another, and we'll, we'll work through uh, with the fire department and the police department as, and the staff as to how we address that. But the road will be open no matter what, and we're agreeing to that in an MR, uh, MOU with the town uh, to, to accommodate that. I think that's all I had for notes. Um, the staff had a handful of other uh, items, uh, probably more than a handful, and, and Dan's got OKs and will be on the plan next to everything else. So I've addressed the, the items that he felt were, were important. So uh, happy to answer questions. Uh, I do have Randy here. If you want to talk about traffic, uh, and our engineers are here as well, uh, if anything else comes up. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here that would like to speak, just please approach the podium, state your name, your address. Thank you. Bye. Good evening. Karen Martin with the uh, Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. I don't usually comment directly on projects at the board level, but I wanted to take a moment um, really to compliment the planning board on their work with the Downs Project. You've had a bounce back and forth um, between the big picture portrayed by the master plan and the day-to-day -day details of um, the individual projects. So this project obviously is complex with a lot of moving parts, um, but you've tackled the big picture one project at a time. Um, and both the board and the developers are working through a project of a scale that I don't think we've ever seen in town. Um, as well as one that is pivotal to the future of the town. And while the whole project is important, I have to admit that my board is particularly interested in the innovation district given the um, lack of industrial or production space in Scarborough and in the region as a whole. And I just wanted to remind all of us that there are businesses, some of them homegrown, um, that we are talking to at SEDCO that are just waiting uh, for this opportunity um, to look at the Innovation District. And you guys are making that happen, so I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you, Karen. Is there anyone else here that would like to provide some public comment on this item? Hi, my name is Sam Marciso, resident of Scarborough. Um, I'm in support of this development. Uh, I own two businesses in Westbrook, employ uh, almost 100 people. Uh, for, for a couple of years now, we've been looking for a new home for those businesses. We've outgrown where we're at. And it's very difficult to, uh, as you know, find industrial space and or even land to build something. 
And when this came up, being a resident for a long time, I was really excited about what was going to happen. And uh, actually, some of the folks that work for me uh, plan on living in the, in the residential side for the work play uh, side of it, work live, I mean. So um, I believe it's a great plan. I'm looking forward to, uh, I've actually reserved a couple of the lots, hoping that this will happen and happen quick. Time is of, of the essence for us. And uh, I hope you guys give it final approval and work, work swiftly. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to provide some public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Rachel. Yeah, I, I, we are extremely close. Um, and I commend the, the folks uh, working with Rocky for also working with us as we start to get a, a little picky, because the closer we get, the, the pickier the details are that are, are left. Uh, I had one question, one of the staff comments was that the applicant provide some sort of infrastructure at the entrance to the trails on the site, i.e. bollards, to ensure motorists do not use them. Was that one of those comments that Dan had that said, yes, we'll do that? Yes, we, we've got a plan for that. Right, I, and I cannot remember if there were also going to be bike racks or benches at those trailheads. There I know are, uh, throughout the project, there are some benches and there are also are some bike racks in, in there. Okay, good. Um, I commend you for the, the work that you've done in terms of both thinking of the, um, the, the placemaking and the effort to merge the Downs area, the open space with Warren Woods. I think the trail system that's going to end up there is, is going to be one of the jewels of, of Scarborough. Uh, I'm really pleased with where this is going. Uh, I understand fully the need to move ahead, and I'm all in favor of moving ahead as speedily as possible so that folks who want to bring jobs to Scarborough know that they can do that and they, they can have a time certain when they can start to plan that. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Roger. Um, first big question, where is Center Street? Uh, I didn't bring my pointer to it. <laughs> Jamel, can you show what Center Street is on the... That's what I thought it might be, but yes. I've never seen it identified. So that street we envision will eventually come down through the downs and come all the way to Heights Parkway. Right into the core. Correct. Just, okay. That's where I thought it was, but I wasn't sure. Um, I totally agree with you on the mass transit. I mean, you have to have demand, because they're not going to come there if there's no, no demand. Um, Rocky, on Bill Bray had quite a number of issues regarding the Holmes Road area. Um, do you have any any problem with any of these things? Um, I don't. I'm not going to say a lot. Uh, you sit down. Uh, <laughs> Bill, we've worked together. Bill's got a long laundry list there. There's not many items actually on that list that pertain to the Innovation District. Um, Randy has answered most of those questions, or I think all of those questions, actually. Um, I don't, do you want to add any more to that? I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Um, I think we're good with Bill's letter. We've got responses going back to him. A lot of this really hinges on uh, the DOT and, uh, and how that all shakes out with their eventual permit. Okay, because they're talking about, he's talking about the, um, the growth rate and the alignment, <clears throat> things like that, you know. Um, Absolutely, all, all things that are gonna get hashed out through the DOT permit and there is work that's gonna be done in, in that as part of later phases of the innovation district. It's, it's, so it's a matter of timing on when all of those things sure. get done. Yeah. yeah. Is, is staff satisfied with that answer? <laughs> we haven't seen the responses, um, so okay. it sounds like it'll, we'll be able to work with that. Okay. Um, I, um, I don't have anything else that I, as long as Dan is giving everybody the okay. So I'd, I'd like to just touch on that one more time. So yeah. I'm not trying to kick that can down the road, but until we have the buy-in from DOT, we don't really know 100% what's, what's going to happen. Randy's got a pretty darn good idea what we're going to have to do. But my point to the board is none of that really applies to what we're trying to do now. We want to get our 
uh, Downs Road built, Innovation Drive, uh, Center Street, get the pump station and get all the infrastructure in the ground and be able to come in and start our planning process with our end users. Nothing can happen until we have that. So we can't put one trip through that intersection until we've done all of that. We've got to have DOT permit and we've got to have um, site plan approvals on every, you know, on the lots as we go. So I just, just trying to make that clear that that's why I feel it's okay to let that, we'll, we'll figure that one out as DOT weighs in and, and we'll get there. I just want to make sure your potential tenant has a way to get out. <laughs> They'll be able to get out. <laughs> Could I, could I add to sure. that? Um, I just had a comment too. I think, to some respects, um, it, I, it's, it's good for our peer review to kind of look at, I'd say, the big picture. But uh, Bill has been a part of all the DOT meetings, our scoping meetings, and things like that. So he's also looking at it at a different context. As Rocky said, there's there's pieces that are for this phase, but then there's other comments that are. A lot have to do more with the DOT portion of it and what will come out in their permit. And I think it's it's good for our peer review to chime in for the DOT permit aspect, but it, uh, some of that is um, separate or beyond, I would say, this phase of the project. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have this information and keep it moving. Um, it's good for the board to be a privy to all of this, I think, um, but I would not say the length of it should be as concerning as it might first appear, if that helps. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm all set. Thanks, Roger. Jen. Um, okay. So I just will add that I am, I echo Karen's comments and, and those of um, other colleagues on the board that this just, there's such a tremendous amount of work that's been done on, on behalf of um, the developer, and it really seems like you just a willingness to work together, which I think is always appreciated. Um, Bill had a comment, Bill Bray had a comment in the traffic review memo about um, your traffic demand management plan, TDM plan, um, and he was suggesting that that master planning effort be initiated as soon as possible. Um, in your introduction, you sort of alluded to the fact that um, it would be more beneficial to do that once you have some t some tenants that are more, you know, you're, you're more sure of tenants that are coming, um, and you can sort of start to monitor some of that activity, um, which, and I can see both sides of that. Um, but I'm just, in general, I'm really interested in um, diving into that plan and reading about that and understanding what this development as a whole is interested in doing in terms of decreasing or in encouraging um, alternate ways to get to this site. Um, because I really, I, I come from a transportation background, but trying to step outside of that for a little bit, I think that any, any work that can be done to that end, and we've seen it on some other projects um, recently, it, it, it has a ripple effect on all of the other pieces. You know, fewer cars coming in is, is less trips through your intersections and, and um, has the potential for less off-site mitigation. Less on-site parking, if you can offset that with transit use, um, is less impervious surface, less stormwater that you have to treat, things like that. Um, and so, you know, recognizing that there's certainly a balance there um, innovation district, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be needing to design around large-scale trucking with wide radiuses and things like that. Um, but I, th that, as I understand it, that um, that effort is designed to kind of address all of that. And so I'm just, I'm really um, looking forward to to reading what you what you come up with for that. Um, and as an example of, I know there was a comment, um, a staff comment about. Um, showing dashed bicycle lanes as they approach intersections and I just th I just think this is like a really tiny piece of um, supporting the argument for coming up with a TDM plan sooner rather than later because you can start to incorporate some of those infrastructure um, changes or not changes but uh, inclusions I'll say earlier on in the process rather than already having your intersection approaches built out, for example, and then saying, shoot, now we actually think we, we have a we have an end user here that we know is going to draw a lot of bike traffic, for example. I don't know if that's the case, but um, where you might at that point feel like you, you wouldn't have um, 
the space to incorporate that. Um, a, a really small example of that larger process. Um, and as to the, speaking to the, um, the inclusion of mass transit and bus, bus work here, I know, that, I know that Dan's been working on that. Um, and I think that, um, I know that it's really hard for people to hop on board, pun intended maybe, with, um, with transit where it doesn't seem like people are using buses now. But this project in particular, so Scarborough sort of has a suburban culture of like we all just take our cars everywhere because that's what we do. Um, but this project in particular, this whole development where, where you're, you're adding, I'm, I'm so excited to see the types of tenants that are coming to this innovation district in particular. Um, but to supplement that and, and, or to approach that with sort of a transit oriented development thought, um, which I think that you're, you know, you're probably doing, and I know that your landscape architect is um, well versed in that too. I think we have the opportunity here to put something forth that's really um, not, you're not going to play catch up on this. You're not going to have a development with a traffic problem and then think, shoot, we, now how do we get, now how do we involve, um, how do we involve buses or how do we reduce trips into the site because the intersection is over capacity. So, uh, part of that's the nature of having a brand new development, but I think that if done right and and with um, with a lot of the things that you're you're working on, um, I think the potential for that is really tremendous, and not just for this site, but sort of helping our whole um, the whole town really. You know, if 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 people, the gentleman who spoke um, about his businesses in Westbrook. There you go. That's, so someone's getting it and thinking, geez, I, I want to live here because I can also work here, and now I know that I don't have to hop in my car to go to a brewery or whatever it is, you know. Um, so th those are the things I'm really excited about doing um, or reading through and, and understanding what you're putting forth. Um, and I would just encourage you that as you're entertaining and seeking out tenants for these individual lots, that you continue to convey your importance on those things to them and hope that they... Um, we'll, we'll, we'll hop on board with you. Um, I'm curious about, so you talked about a memorandum of understanding using the Downs Road op or opening that back up to public, um, public use during construction. I'm wondering if you have looked at um, what, what type of volume you might be expecting there and whether or not that would have an impact on um, adjacent roadways or intersections. <coughs> Understanding that the road has been there for a while and sh I'm sure that people have, a certain number of people have been using it as a cut through, but um, given that it's, in, uh, it's improved, it's a little easier to drive on, I just didn't know if you had a sense for whether or not, um, what, what type of traffic you think that might be handling. Um. I was told that about 1,100 cut-throughs a day is what occurred before we closed the road. Um, That's a lot more than that. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get 1,100 back because people are going to realize that it's not the quick way anymore. Yep. Uh, obviously, there will be some cut-through. Sure. Um, I don't know if Randy can, can address that, that better than I can, but... No. Uh, it's, that's, that's what it was. It was 1,100 to, to start with. And, uh, Obviously, it's been closed now, you know, since fall. Sure. So we've we've lost a lot of that. Um, in the meantime, the business is still open. The track is still open and doing business. Their customers have been coming, uh, coming off the uh, Payne Road. Uh, they've been longing for us to get Route One open because they do feel like some of their traffic will will use that. So that it will it will get a little bit busier. Um, and our you know our agreement with the town is that we'll we'll maintain a travel way through there, and uh, and keep it passable. That's all I have. Thanks, Jen. Rick? Yeah, I feel like every time you come and share stuff, I get really excited with what, what's going on and then hearing, you know, local contractors wanting to move their shop into this. This is, this is what Scarborough needs. And, um, he's you not know... Even, he's not even a good one, Rick. <laughs> uh, he's not. Uh, he's a good one for somebody that, what I know he does. Um, but at any rate... Uh, while you're doing all of this work in that new area, uh, keep in mind that I'll be looking for ways of maybe putting some 
solar farms in there and things of that nature. And when you come to us on the site plan on the individual lots, uh, it'll be interesting to see the profiles of these buildings and where we might be able to uh, supplement and uh, further help these businesses with their utility costs. So uh, I'll weigh in there. But I I'm really appreciate the effort and the the work your team has done and getting it this far. And I think, uh, you know, I won't delay you digging any more dirt, so I'll be quiet. Thanks. For so we're going to do the educational portion of the session. Could you, for maybe the people at home, not necessarily the chair, explain what three-phase power is? <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about power. <laughs> I do know that you can't pull your hand back quick enough if you get yourself in trouble. Um, three-phase power, that I believe, Billy, help me out, 34 kW, it's, it's, it's big power. It's massive power. Um, CMP doesn't even have that much out on Payne Road at this point in time. Uh, it's further up towards the intersection. So we want to bring, they want to, us to bring, we want to bring that through the project so that we have all the power we could possibly need to power this light industrial area. We could actually, you know, we could have some power users, some users that really need a lot of power um, in that especially. And then not knowing really how the, the downtown is going to develop out, what those needs are going to be in the future, it's, it's really a shot in the dark. So the plan is to, is to have a system in there that, that can really handle uh, about anything that we, that we come back with. Okay, and then uh, so can, as a follow-up. Follow-up on that, though. So t thinking about what, what does three-phase power look like to the average person? Right. Driving down Haggis Parkway, you see those taller poles, and they've got a diamond shape on the top um, with four wires. That's three-phase power. So that's a, that's a similar situation. Many of you maybe haven't gotten into the downs uh, because we've had the road closed, um, but we have that system already started coming in from, from Route 1. And that was on the plan, and I do feel like we talked about that um, early on. The staff felt we needed to clarify it in, in this, this phase, and that's why we're talking about it tonight. But um, it's important that we, that we have adequate power. So those are the same types of poles you would bring through Innovation Way, Yes. Overhead. Mm -hmm. And then down Center Street as well? Down Center Street, but we realize that we're probably not going to be able to bring that pole system all the way through Center Street. As we develop the, the downtown, we're going to have to figure a way around and then drop down under, underground. And I don't know whether it's going to involve in the future on the back side of the track or whether it'll be on the front side of the track, but somehow we'll have to connect those links. We know we can bring it in from Haggis Parkway. Uh, and connect in. So, but the main, your main road, your Scarborough Downs Road, will have that, that pole system on it. Just like Haggis Parkway, just like Enterprise Business Park next door, same type of system. But outside of the Downs Road Innovation Way and Center Street, that is all the overhead you will see. I could not make that commitment to you tonight uh, because I don't know enough about it. That's, that's our intention. Uh, to try to limit it to those main areas to get it through. So for this phase? So for this phase, if we want to talk about Innovation District, mm -hmm. it's our intention that it would be just on the two public roads. We should be able, if we have users that are going to use those lots as we've designed them, individual lots, they're probably not, their power requirements probably aren't going to be so great that we can't serve them underground. The wild card being, we get one user come in, comes in, and as you know, we've talked about putting these lots together. We've got one user that comes in and puts you know, six lots together. They're a 150,000 square foot user with needing a lot of power. We may need to set a point pole on the other side and come into there. So, but that would be, we would talk about that with the board at site plan approval to figure out how best to serve those users. And I think this is, I think, probably goes to the heart of what staff is expecting over the next couple weeks that you guys can iron out and solidify on the plans. Is that, is that an accurate statement? I think we've, we've told you what we know with the in Innovation District so far. As we come back with site plans, I think we can be clearer individually. Okay. That. All right. Um, outside of that, I believe my colleagues hit most everything. Let me just check my notes real quick. Oh, yeah. The uh, $100 million question. Uh, do you have any issues outside of the main elements 
that staff has listed here as you go into finalizing these plans for your next appearance? I don't feel we do, no. We have, Dan and I went down through this and we've got OKs written next to a bunch of these things. I've covered the, the items he had on his okay. list, so I think we're good. All right. Uh, so the request here um, from our board is to have this on the, as a consent item on the 22nd. Uh, is the board comfortable with staff working with the applicant until the 22nd to get this ready for consent? Bunch of nodding heads. Congratulations. See you Thank a little you. later. Appreciate it. Thanks. <coughs> Next item is Cottages at Sawyer, LLC, request a preliminary <laughs> subdivision review for 98 Sawyer Road, Assessor's Map R59, Lot 8C. Jamal. One minute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project is located uh, in the VR4 zoning district um, along Sawyer Road. Um, so the applicant was actually here at the last meeting um, for a preliminary review. Uh, the proposal includes 69 lots, um, 93 residential units, includes 61 single family homes and 16 duplexes. As a reminder, the VR4 zoning district standards are intended to promote the establishment of higher density village style development with an interconnected network for landscape streets, blocks and pedestrian ways. Um, so a few items to chat, talk about. Um, so the applicant um, will be required to pay a recreation contribution fee uh, per unit of occupancy or lot prior to the issuance of a building permit. However, the applicant has requested uh, the, their donation to the land trust of around four and a half acres, along with the trailhead parking area in the development uh, be considered in lieu of the fee. So the board should be sure to provide uh, direction to the applicant on this item. And staff continues to recommend that the applicant extend the landlocked right-of-way um, or another sort of right-of-way to the easterly property line to enable for a potential future connection to Gorham Road. Uh, this right-of-way should be provided on the final plan. At this point, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamal. Applicant, please uh, introduce and try to keep to the big main points we've seen this. Absolutely. I'm Maureen McGlone from Ransom Consulting. I'm filling in for Steve Bradstreet tonight, so I apologize if I don't know exactly what went on the last few times, but I do have Mark O'Leary with me and hopefully he will step in when I falter. Um, this is, uh, we are here tonight again, as Jamel said, uh, as a sort of a continuation from, we were here at the last meeting on the 10th. Uh, subsequently, we've had a meeting with staff on June 12th, uh, went over a number of items, um, and hopefully uh, I can hit those points so that uh, the board understands what some of those items were. Um, we did provide uh, to the board a, an 11 page response to all the comments that we had received, and hopefully you folks have got that, and it's, uh, it, but if there's anything that I can add to those responses, then I will. A number of items that were discussed at the uh, meeting on the 12th um, involved uh, the dead end sections at Camry and Cape Road. Um, let me just kind of use a little pointer here. Right in there and right in there. Um, the agreement uh, out of that meeting was that um, the applicant would provide uh, 85 feet from the Sunline uh, pavement and then gravel uh, at the end of it, uh, 20 feet of gravel for snow storage. Um, and the driveways would not be allowed within 20 feet of the end of the pavement. Um, in addition, uh, the terminus of Preservation Way within Phase 1, which is in this area right in here, uh, was discussed with uh, Jim Butler on the 17th um, in an effort to get uh, emergency vehicles to be able to back up and, and uh, move out. And they have agreed to go 
It's a little bit more slanty from here, uh, 90 degrees off of the roadway, so that they can back in, turn around, and we will be showing that on the final plan, if that makes any sense at all. It's very small, I'm sorry. Those were the key points that um, they had had with the meeting with the town. There are other points, as Jamel had discussed, the rec fee. Um, in addition, uh, the easement from uh, Landlock Lane. Uh, one of the other items that I thought um, would be important was the uh, sidewalk waiver that I think uh, Mark O'Leary would be willing to step in on. Uh, Mark O'Leary, Cottages at Sawyer, LLC. Um, the major items that we had were the, the easement with landlocked, uh, and the conclusion we came up with is to make that part of lot three, uh, that 50-foot stretch, and make it an easement um, for future uh, development, whether it be a road for the town or a And the other big item was the sidewalks on Sawyer Road. Uh, we were looking to make the recreational fee um, or a contribution uh, to the fund uh, to be only used for sidewalks on Sawyer Road. Those were the bigger issues. Can I just ask you to clarify real quick? Um, you sure can. The the contribution you speak of, is this the recreation contribution fee or is this the sidewalk multimodal reserve fee? Well, with what the town came back with on, it was in the uh, comments twice. And I do feel that uh, from a recreational standpoint, what we're doing with the donated land, but the, the as well as the parking lot, and we're probably spending a little bit more than that whole recreational fee on the seven open spaces that we're, we're creating within the subdivision. Um, that's where that waiver was requested. The, we had a sidewalk on one side waiver that the board was okay with and they looked for a contribution. Um, that's the contribution I'm speaking of that uh, I would wanna make sure it was used for sidewalks on Sawyer Road and did not go into a, a bigger fund that may be used for something different. Is that uh, the end of your presentation? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If there's anyone here that would like to speak on this item, please approach the podium. All right. Seeing none, Rachel. Yeah, um, I'd like to wait a little bit. Defer your time. Yeah. I defer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll mix it up. Rick. You get first stab at this one. Um, I didn't see a design for the trailhead, uh, the parking area on the trailhead. Is that, did you work that out with staff? Uh, not with staff. It is all designed. Uh, we knew we couldn't submit it after our submittal for this meeting. It's basically a 50 by 60 gravel area with a trail going into the corner of uh, the donated land, which would be right there. Sure. That's it. Yeah. Um, and Chair, I'm comfortable with going to the 22 feet on the uh, pavement width. I think that's all I had from the last meeting. Kind of talked a lot at the last board meeting on, on concerns, um, mainly the sidewalks. And I agree if you're going to put the funds in the floor, sidewalks to, to go on those, to those sidewalks. That's all I have. Thank you, Rick. Jen? Okay. Um, <clears throat> can staff give a quick summary of what? The town's recreation fees, what types of things those fees typically go for? 
like maintenance of parks and things like that? I can try. Um, so typically, as I understand it, the recreation fee is um, you're adding more folks to town parks and facilities. <laughs> uh, so it's, an, it's a fee to account for the extra use. Sure. Okay, that's what I thought. And it, it's typically, I think, for um, capital improvement, not maintenance per se, but added okay. features and amenities. Sure, okay. Is that how we got the cricket, or the, uh, not the cricket, but the paddle ball courts? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, and will the land trust be fully taking over the maintenance of this, the open spaces that you're talking about? Uh, the open space with the parking area will, re will be part of the open space within the subdivision. <clears throat> okay, so not, not the... Um, not for the land trust. No, I thought it was easier where that's going to be plowed once it's given to the town. Um, it's a direct. Okay. So will be made. So the town will be maintaining it. Correct. The, the trail, the parking anyway. Okay. Um, will you be, um, any type of signage there at the trailhead, <coughs> park here, don't park here, that kind of thing, trailhead here, um, and or signage elsewhere? Um, throughout the project limits? And there'll be one uh, sign uh, meeting the ordinance uh, as you come in, so it won't be larger than the 32 square feet. We can absolutely add something to that, letting, uh, stating that that parking is there for the land trust. Yeah, so, so that's what I'm getting at. I think that, I think it's great that you're adding this. Um, I just think that it would be terrific to make that easily known to the public if it's going to be available for public use. Um, I know, for example, um, Portland Trails in Portland, you know, they have a lot of the little, they're small, they're like four, four by six inch maybe, maybe they're bigger than that, um, little placards that often get put on wooden posts that are kind of low down that help identify um, trailheads or, you know, if, if the trail, if there's trail access at the end of a dead end street, sometimes you'll see one of those signs up at the entrance to that street that would let someone know that that was, um, that that was able you know, or available for their use at the other end. Um, so something like that I think would just be really, would sort of emphasize that, that you are providing that, um, that offering to the general public and not just, um, <coughs> to the people in this development. Um, and curious if you could speak to the difference between, so you made reference to, I think the, the staff memo said, um, <coughs> right of way. Okay, so, so the staff has asked for the applicant to extend the land lock lane right of way to the easterly property line. Um, but you made reference to that as an easement across lot three as opposed to a dedicated right-of-way like the other streets? Yeah. Right now, what I had done is retain this stretch here, which is 50 by 420 maybe, mm -hmm. and then also this strip. The reason that was held is if the town is ever looking to actually get to the downs, I know they can't under the ordinances right now under the zoning, but you could go just like that, and then you're a short ways away. And you've got about 600 feet that way to go around. So in holding this as part of that lot, uh, originally I was gonna hold it as open space, but in hindsight, looking at it now, um, I think the easement directly from me where I'm gonna retain lot three uh, would be to keep it with that. Does staff have an opinion on that difference? I guess I'd refer to our town engineer, sorry. Uh, um, I guess it was the question about the alignment. The question is about whether or not, so he's talking about offering an easement over a lot, mm. over lot three. Right here, and Rachel. the difference between that and a dedicated right of way, like what is shown for the interior network of roads. Right, and I, I think we talked about that with staff and um, it was something that we were gonna um, refer back to our attorneys okay. because in order for us to, in the future, build a road, we need more than an easement. We need to have 
we need to hold that that title and that fee for that land. So <clears throat> I, I think that's a legal question, but from what I have seen in my experience, I think we need to actually have that as part of the right of way. And what the town had actually asked for is a right of right of way from this point mm -hmm. to that point. And the reason I'm suggesting it the way, and this is coming from legal, okay. is that to me that serves everybody much better. Uh, there isn't a lot of wetlands you, that you're going through. If you ever did it this way, they're going to either come up and do that, or they're going to come up and come back down through the hammerhead. Then they're going to come down to another stop sign, turn and have to come out this way, or up and over wherever uh, any connectivity ever ended up, whether it ever happens. And I sure. think we were in agreement with the alignment, and, and I think it was a good suggestion, as you said, is as how you get there, it's just whether that's an easement or, right. or part yeah. of the right away. I, I'm more interested in, <clears throat> in the preserving the future connectivity, wherever that may be. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, makes total sense. It's a great legal question. <laughs> it's, it's a little above my head. Um, last question, again, maybe for staff. So, um, or I'm, in, I'm supportive of the, um, the contribution for sidewalks on Sawyer Road. I think it's totally appropriate that, um, that you would ask for those to be <clears throat> used in that way. Does the town have a, <clears throat> a path forward on that? I guess I just want to clarify <clears throat> when we talk about um, just a little history lesson, I think, first off, when we talk about the multimodal fund that's set up, we set that up specifically when a project came through, and actually it was on Gorham Road. And as many of you know, Gorham Road is under construction. Um, and it was further down Gorham Road, a future phase on Gorham Road. And while we have a conceptual plan for sidewalk, and our intention is to put sidewalk, and this was for the brewery further down. Um, it made sense for them to say contribute now mm -hmm. um, instead of building it, not knowing exactly where we were going to put it, but conceptually it was there. And what we were told is, is setting up this reserve account. It does go in as kind of a general account for us to be able to use for sidewalks throughout town. That is true. But if you specifically are calling out um, for the sidewalk to be built on Sawyer Road, that would be a different fund. That would be something that we would have to set up separately. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that it would have to be spent within the fiscal year, which um, I'm going to probably assume that the developer is not putting up the full 100% to build that sidewalk, which means um, we would have to look for town funding to match to be able to construct that out um, and so it really puts us in a situation where I don't see that it's feasible um, especially in this where the budget is just passed so we're waiting a whole nother year um, that we would have that ability to even have the conversation um, to be able to have some match money to be able to finish the project so I don't know as um, we'd have to investigate further on if we would do a separate reserve account, which is a council process, um, or if there's other options or opportunities. But I think when you get into specific, it's not as simple as contributing to multimodal. So, so that makes sense. And I would just want to make sure that you weren't contributing towards a project that either we didn't have a plan for or that wasn't feasible in a, you know, in a in a time frame that needed to happen. I wasn't aware of the one year, um, the, the fiscal year expenditure requirement, um, but that makes sense so that the town probably doesn't collect fees and not use them. <laughs> in my research, I was told five years on that. Mm. And this is out of respect to the, the residents of Sawyer Road that I have spoken with. This was probably their number one concern mm -hmm. was there's no sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, and I just feel like if there's money that's coming from this, whether it be from the recreational fee or other funds, mm -hmm. that's where it should be used. Mm -hmm. um, the term, the, the time frame to do it, there's going to be a lot going on on Sawyer Road. Uh, I'm okay if it's a different time frame. It's just I would like to see it allotted to that. Sure. Okay. I think I can speak for the town and say we're very supportive of a sidewalk on Sawyer Road as well. It's an important connection to the town center and 
it was an Oak Hill pedestrian plan, so I think we're all in agreement there. Thank you, Jen. You all set? All set. Roger. Um, regarding the, um, it, it's lot four, I believe, is going to be donated to the Scarborough Land Trust. Yes. And have they agreed to that? Uh, they have been given all the information. I talked with uh, Rich Bard, I believe it was. They've sent me over everything uh, with the understanding that once we move forward, that they would be given the deed information and uh, they're very interested. Okay, good. Um, I, I would echo what um, Jen said about the signage, uh, especially down on uh, Sawyer Road. Is that what you were referring to also, down on Sawyer Road? Just so people know that there's something in there. The public knows that there's a, there's a trailhead inside the development, you know? Absolutely, that's yeah. not a... Um, and, you know, this, um, this blank piece of land right at the end of Landlock? Right there, yeah. Wasn't that supposed to be... There's four cottages going there. Oh, that's what I thought, okay. And then you have duplexes going Three down duplexes there. down here. Okay, that's what I thought, okay. Um, no, I, 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 I'm pretty well satisfied at this point, I think. Um, I do have, a, just out of curiosity, um, are these, are these, um, these got all gonna be manufactured homes, is that correct? I would like to tell you yes. Uh, there's a possibility that I'll sell off 10, 12 lots. Okay. And I probably won't have the control over those. Everything else will be modular. And would they be similar to, just out of curiosity, like the, um, the newer section of Hillcrest? I'm sorry? The newer, newer section of Hillcrest? You know, a state manufactured home down the back? To a degree. Yeah, okay. Um, I think there's a little bit more design factor to them, okay. but, but similar qualities. Somewhere between that and like Magnolia Place? Or Correct. Okay, all right, good. Um, I think I'm all, I'm all set, I think. I think. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Rachel. Hey, actually, some of um, the concerns I had have been addressed. I was doing just fine until you said, uh, talked about the easement along route, along uh, lot three and I was trying to find what was going to go on lot three, and it took me a while to figure out that it was actually split into two. Correct. Um, so you're still planning, even though there's an easement, you're going to adjust the location of the cottages? Yes, there's enough room to adjust whatever I need to to get those in. Uh, it may change the configuration of the cottages a little bit, but that's all. All right, so we're still looking, in spite of that, we're still looking at the same number of houses, proposed houses. Numbers are not going to change. Okay. Um, did you have any questions or any issues with the recommendations that the staff had in terms of the, um, some of the proposed open spaces? No, we've designed all the open spaces, and I can give you a quick overview. Um, we are going to use the hardscapes that were recommended from split rail fences to uh, designating with oversized rock. Uh, we're going to do a lot of planting as far as uh, buffering uh, any neighbor to an open space. For instance, right in here, that's an open space. I will certainly make sure that this is buffered right in here. Um, and the wetlands that are around it will be protected. So at some point we'll see a landscape plan? Yes. Okay. All right, I think, I think my confusion has been cleared up. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so I just wanna just make sure we're clear uh, as a board and for the applicant as well. So you have really two big issues that we need to kind of weigh in on, which is um, this sidewalk waiver request, um, which is a contribution fee as it stands to a multimodal reserve account, um, which is not a dedicated fund. That's that's what I believe the option is here until it's further investigated whether or not there's a separate reserve fund. Mm -hmm. So if the separate reserve fund for just Sawyer Road doesn't go through, right, is that, are you just willing to turn it over to the multimodal reserve account and hope that the town 
fulfills the promise of getting sidewalks on Sawyer Road someday? The, the piece of the sidewalk that we were speaking of was coming from where Sawgrass was mm -hmm. to our opening, which is about 1,250 feet. Um, there's not a lot of gully there, so I think that, uh, once again, for the people that live on the residents on the street, I think the sooner we could get that done, the better off we are, uh, the, the safer they'll feel. So I, I believe that that would become another conversation that we'd have. One way or another, that fund will be there. I'm not worried about that. Um, and the second issue is um, how does the board interpret the proposal to uh, use the donated land to the land trust and the trailhead parking in, in lieu of that 500 per lot concert, uh, recreation fee? How do we feel about that? It's about 35000 ish dollars in mm -hmm. recreation contribution fees that would not be obtained in this situation. However, we are getting some open spaces, some land trust, um, and some trailhead parking. How does the board uh, view this trade-off, so to speak? Right now, you have to go to uh, Payne Road to get into Warren Woods. The schools are right across the street. So, going to need some, some input here. Rachel. Um, I, I frankly think it's a bad precedent. Um, we, we really ask uh, of a lot of developers in terms of creating as much open space as possible, whether it's open space that belongs to the conservation development or it's open space that is then connected to or part of land that's owned by the land trust. And uh, we really don't see that as a trade-off as far as I can remember for recreation. So it's something that I would be opposed to. Thank you, Rachel. Roger, Jen. Um, I seem, didn't, didn't we do this in the past with Sun Project? I, um, I made a fuss one day. Oh, you um, did? Yes, years ago. Believe it or not, I made a fuss. Um, I always I remember question, your fusses. <laughs> I question the authority of the board as to whether or not we could even dictate where the contribution fees could go or not. Um, there was discussion about taking it from one, from the recreation actually fund at one point and putting it to a multimodal account or something. And I kind of, I said, why, why are we allowed to do that? But uh, yeah, this has cropped up before. Did, it, did we, was it determined whether we could do it or not? I was, I was all by myself on the ledge. <laughs> no, no, I hung on. Um, it was it was a good project. It's just uh, I I don't think we ever had clarity as to whether or not this board really could do that. Um, is is it an equal trade off? Do we know? It's, I, it's not even so much of as a trade off at this point. I think is what you're talking about though is this this recreation contribution fee yeah. is supposed to be paid, and the applicant is basically asking us, hey, look what I'm giving you. I think well, we could waive that. I guess the argument could be made, though, that it is a recre you know, recreational type sure. development, you know, <laughs> where there's going to be a trailhead and everything there. So, I mean, it, it would fit into that broad. It's not like it's they're giving us swampland or something like that. Yeah. Uh, um, I would but say I, I would I, say that this this recreation fund goes goes for it's it's put to use for all of the people in the town, whereas some may view some of these projects as kind of just locale to this development. And so my instinct is to say we, we don't waive a contribution fee here in this situation. Um, as generous as the offerings have been, and I'm glad you're doing them, I still think um, the recreation fee is, is warranted here. That's my two cents, if it helps persuade anyone else. Well, now that I've been educated in some of the past dealings, I'll, uh, I'll support the recreational fee uh, payment versus the, the trade-off. I think I would, too. What are you, you going to do? I think, I'll, I'll agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think what they're saying is that they still, they still want to see the uh, recreation contribution fee made. I heard it the other way. <laughs> 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 I, 
think you, uh, that's four. Roger, Roger gets to remain silent unless he'd like to Well, I'm in. not going out on any cliff. <laughs> 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 All right, so you have your answer there. Um, Outside of that, I believe, uh, is staff and the applicant comfortable with all the remaining details that you get to work out going forward? So, nodding heads. We had a comment uh, in the town comments, and that was that they wanted to see stubbing on the uh, force main down Sawyer Road. I've had multiple uh, conversations with David Hughes with the sanitary district, and he has said multiple times that he wanted to just see the trunk. Um, if you want to have T's or Y's off it, I'll gladly put those, but to stub on the properties or anything, that's you're rebuilding the road to a degree. Um, I don't think that's my job here. The, uh, one of the things that I saw in the ordinance is if you're creating more for the town benefit uh, than your traffic fee, then those can be waived in comparison. Um, I can tell you the sewer line coming down Sawyer Road um, is better than twice the cost of uh, the traffic impact fee. Then you throw the sidewalks on top of that. I, th I think a lot is being put out there in lieu of. I appreciate your thoughts on that. <laughs> um, anyone else? Uh, as far as your waiver requests, uh, I think all of those, as far as by my count, from comments here at the planning from the from my colleagues, um, I believe all of them were relatively acceptable to staff and the board. I think that's it. So with that said, I will make a motion to approve. Uh, to provide preliminary subdivision approval for the cottages at Sawyer LLC. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor. First big step. On behalf of my family and myself, I say thank you. But I have one more question. Sure. Uh, given the time frame and moving along and the way this uh, subdivision sets up, and I would never do it without board approval, but it would make sense to go in and cut what's gonna be cut in here, because once they start, obviously I don't want any trucks coming in where they're doing any work. So with the board's approval, I'd like to go in and cut that um, in what the near I, future. What I'd recommend at this stage is that you work with the town to develop that plan. They will bring it right to our attention if they think it's something that's beyond kind of an administrative review. Okay. So they'll, they'll pop it right back in front of us if it need be, and, what, was what I'm saying. Okay, and obviously DEP would be involved, and, um, but it, it makes sense uh, given the time of year, so, okay. Sure. Thank you. I thank you. Next item on the agenda is the Rock Church of Greater Portland requests a site plan amendment for 66 Gorham Road, Assessor's Map R58, Lot 19. Ready? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is located in the R4 zoning district um, along Gorham Road. Um, so the applicant's proposing a 10,760 square foot building addition to the existing Rock Church. Uh, the board may recall the applicant was granted approval um, for a slightly larger building addition in, I think it was May of 2018. Um, so staff has offered several comments about the proposed, uh, I guess, redesign of the building um, that the board should discuss, including the proposed siding, materials, and uniformity. And at this point, I'll ask Angela to address some comments on Gorham Road. Thank you. Um, I think when staff first, actually, even this morning, Jamel and I were talking about tonight, um, uh, Gorham Road is obviously well into construction. Um, we've been coordinating with the Rock Church um, and their services, the, the utility services, um, out to Gorham Road. And we're kind of at a critical point. That's where I kind of wanted to put it in, in the comments just to make sure we had this conversation. Um, as of today, I know um, I have 
coordinated with both Shaw Brothers out there as well as um, the church's um, liaison and trying to put them together and get that work done. So I'm feeling a lot more confident than I did maybe 10 hours ago. <laughs> I don't know what time it is now. It's getting late. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm confident that we're moving forward, which is huge. This has taken a little bit of time. So um, appreciate the, the work and that coordination. Thank you, Angela. And if you could just go over some of the main elements. Sure. We've seen this, and I know it's an amendment, and um, you were, we're changing some of the architectural features on this, but Great. most of the other remaining elements have remained, correct? Great. My name is Tom Greer from Walsh Engineering. Um, we've done the civil engineering portion of this. The uh, site plan is changing very little. The um, building has shrunk by a couple hundred square feet. I don't think that will be noticeable as you drive by, whether you'll see that or not. So from a visual point of view, um, the size reduction is really uh, no change at all. From, from that point of view, we have changed some of the entrances around and a little bit of the sidewalks at those. And again, I think those just accommodate the new building footprint. Uh, one of the things we have changed is the utilities coming into the building, and we've simplified those so that there is uh, a little less conflict, uh, and we think that those are going to be a little simpler to build, and, uh, and speaking to Angela's comments, um, a little easier to coordinate. So we'll be, be moving forth on those with tonight's approval um, to make those, make those connections work a little easier. Um, with me tonight is uh, John Leisure, uh, the architect, and I, based on the staff's comments, I think he's really the one that you want to talk to. So I'll let John do the introduction. Hi, I'm, my name is John Leisure, and I'm actually I'm filling in for Mr. Dwight Herdrich, who is actually the architect on this project. And... Um, I understand you've seen this project before, so it's um, not completely new to you. The, the main design changes are in the siding. We uh, have incorporated uh, horizontal and vertical siding into the project. And the, the colors, the light dark gray and the light gray and the banding, the brownish banding, have remained the same as the previous submission. And I'd like to address maybe some of your comments uh, by the board. The first one is in reference to the, ref the, the metal being reflective. It certainly will not be reflective or, or bright colored in any way. We're going to provide a low luster Kynar paint finish to all the panels. And the, the, vertical, the vertical metal will have ribbing, which is about six, six or seven inches between the ribs and the horizontal banding metal will be about 12 to 17 inches between the ribs to create a diverse effect. So it will not be a reflective surface at all. Uh, the second item references the, well actually providing horizontal siding on the entire building. We, we don't feel that's the proper approach to this building. As, as the building is over 100 feet long, we would need some vertical elements to break up the facade to create some kind of, to create the interest that I think the building needs. And the other item was about the stone. We are planning to wrap the corner of the building. On the east elevation right now, it's about 18 feet in width along that east elevation. We are going to wrap the corner and, and continue to the south about two and a half feet and that change was, was mostly because the roof, the roof on the previous submission was flat, so we were able to, to ex extend the stone further. In this, in this submission, the roof is pitched to the north and the south, so it would be difficult to provide more stone on along, the, uh, along the south elevation. The other item that you mentioned was the spandrel glazing panels on the east elevation. We are planning to do a, a Lexan opaque black panel with the same window frames as we are using in the storefront entrances on the, on the north and south side entries, which will create the effect of looking like glass. 
The other item that you mentioned, the canopy colors, they, we certainly are in agreement with you on the banding of the canopies to remain the same color, which would be the brownish, the brownish color. That will certainly be changed to reflect that. And I believe that's the list that you have. If you have any more questions, I'd be happy to try to field them for you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If there's anyone here that would like to speak, please approach the podium. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. I'm just going to ask uh, staff a quick clarifying question on that comment with the horizontal surfaces or the, sorry, provide a horizontal metal siding on all sides of the building. Were you referencing perhaps this long stretch out in the bath on the north elevation? Uh, no, we didn't really look at the existing building. Um, that was in reference to the proposed um, structure. And Please help me here. Uh, where, where specifically on these elevations did you think it would work? I'm no architect, <laughs> um, but <laughs> typically, you know, in New England, you see horizontal siding. So I think the comment was uh, intended to mean that all vertical siding be horizontal mm -hmm. to meet the New England vernacular. I see what you mean. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, this is um, this is a case of beauty. Beauty may be in the eye of the beholder. So I just open it up in general to anyone that wants to jump in. I personally think the the, the design is, is a nice looking building, um, and I, I appreciate your taking the time to answer all of those uh, outstanding issues. And I, I personally do not have any um, anything to uh, contend with after your responses. So, yes, Roger. Um, I agree with you on the uh, building. I think it. Is a handsome looking building and um, on that second bullet the word it says the architecture architecture of the building shall that's pretty definitive to me but I I, I disagree with that you know I, I think this building looks nice and I agree with the architect if you want with the horizontal you need you need some of the um, the vertical to break it up and I think it looks really very attractive. So, I don't, I don't know. Thank you, Roger. Anyone else care to chime in on any of these? Um, I will just say that I uh, ex extend a thank you for working with the town on getting what sounds like we'll be able to get those utility connections in um, prior to Finish paving, yeah. Um, works best for everybody that way. <laughs> so I know that sometimes that can mean maybe accelerating your schedule beyond what you were initially intending, but on behalf of the town, I think it's um, worthy of a thank you. And uh, just a question about the contrast between the existing and proposed portion of your building and whether or not um, any thought was given to kind of, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? This, to, to, to ha have some sort of consistency or connection maybe visually between the two. Well, they're gonna be, there's not gonna be a gap. Right, no, there, I mean, no gap. I mean the aesthetics of it. The, the aesthetic, the existing building right now has the horizontal clapboard look to it, mm -hmm. and you see a lot of roof. Our building, you will not see any of the roof, even though it's going to be the same color, the metal roof. Um, as far as the connection, uh, it's just going to be metal trim as we turn as we turn the corner there. It's not going to be anything that's going to really stand out. So no other improvements proposed for the existing portion of the building, say a continuation of any of the materials or anything that you're proposing on the front end? No, no. Okay, that's all. And I'll um, go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, um, there was a request, if you could do that, to provide a sample of the material. 
We, are, we have ordered the materials, and they will be here within the week, and we'd be happy to bring them to staff to, to look at that. I, I would appreciate I, that to just check the reflectiveness so I the staff a, has a chance to weigh in a bit. I, I do have a copy of the profiles of the, of the metal panels and the colors, if you'd like to see those. I yes, could, I would. I could certainly pass those out to you. <clears throat> Are there any changes that you propose? Uh, I realize that there's not a lot of change in the footprint, but are you proposing any changes to the landscaping around the building? I'd have to refer that to my civil. We uh, moved a few things around to accommodate the new layout, but it's really the same landscape plan that you've seen before. Okay, thank you. That's it, Nick. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'll just, um, I'm also going to say just in, in defense of staff and, and the board here, both, uh, we have an ordinance that says you're supposed to have a New England style character to your building. And it's really difficult to make that work with some of our newer construction. Um, and the idea of trying to be a little bit more modern yet still kind of maintain that New England character. It's quite a difficult balance it and... Um, it's not going to be corrugated siding. Yeah. It's not going to be... <laughs> but, <laughs> I, you, you know... Let me share something with you. This, this board, I know, has in the past struggled with uh, a few of the more modern-looking buildings that have come along. And not that they aren't, um, you know, visually attractive. It's just how does it jive with our ordinance? And I think that's always the tricky part. Um, you know, I think... I think we have to, you know, try to appreciate the features on here, like the stonework for kind of that New England vibe to it. So we okay. appreciate that the efforts there. Okay. Um, outside of that, I don't think anyone else here on the board is maybe. I think we're all set. So okay. with that, I'm going to move to approve the site plan amendment project titled Building Expansion 2017, proposed by the Rock Church of Greater Portland as depicted on the plan set prepared by Walsh Engineering Associates, LLC, dated 6 10 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to construct a 10,760 square foot addition with associated parking, landscaping, utilities, and stormwater management infrastructure. The property is located within the residential R4 district and is identified on the town of Scarborough tax maps as map R58, lot 19. Planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, one, permit the proposed parking aisle width of 22 feet. Conditions, one, the applicant shall complete the site work associated with services, including water, natural gas, and underground electric by 7-12-19. Two, prior editions of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, <coughs> modify the top of the entrance canopy along the building's southern elevation so it matches the top of the building's northern entrance canopy. B, revise the plan title to 2019 building elevation. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall A, demarcate the stream setback on the site with construction fencing. B, Coordinate the final layout of under, under drain soil filter number two with the planning department. C. Coordinate with the fire department in regards to the, to the requirement required to the required outdoor access walk pass for the proposed addition. Four. Prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall submit a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Five. Prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. This meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Yes, Roger. Did you include A? Uh, no. No? Okay. It was left out. Okay. So your original copies A and B were scratched out, and only C and D remain. Okay. They became the new AB. Any other discussion? All in favor? Sure, that is unanimous. Thank you and good luck. Thank you.
So we have approximately 30 minutes, uh, and we have one, two, three, four more business items to go through. So take that for what it is worth if you were here for the last item of the evening. Um, number 13, Valentine Delvalent, LLC, requests an amended subdivision review, the 14th Amendment, for the Eastern Village Subdivision, Assessor's Map RO73, Lot 21A. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is located in the TND and R4 zoning districts, the Eastern Village subdivision. So the applicant's proposing several updates to the approved 13th amended plan, including the addition of two adjacent properties, creation of several new lots, and the creation of a right-of-way connecting Ballantyne Drive to Ward Street. Staff is generally comfortable with the proposed subdivision amendment, but has re re recommended several uh, plan edits to ensure consistency with past approvals. Staff has also recommended that the applicant coordinate a meeting with Public Works and the town engineer on the proposed street design. And in terms of the subdivision amendment, um, not the next uh, item on the agenda, the motion has been provided to the board with conditions for your consideration. Thank you, Jamel. Kerry? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Kerry Anderson representing Ballantyne Development. I would be happy to go over any and all comments from staff, peer review, and also uh, uh, neighborhood homeowners. I think most of those are probably for the next agenda. This preliminary to subdivision request is really pretty straightforward. Um, and I, we will work with uh, town engineer. We had a meeting with town engineer staff fire department uh, a couple months ago and uh, but we can get back together with town engineer and public works if there's any more that we need to discuss regarding that and um, a lot of the other details that came in that request um, we have no issue with that um, I don't know if you want to get into road geometrics in this particular request or if you want to wait for site plan which I realize is coming up next but I'm happy to talk about that whenever you feel that's appropriate? We'll tackle site plan on the next item. Let's just look at the uh, amendments on this one and take from there. So. Very good. So with that, I think that uh, we have a road connection as for vehiculars that traverses through the property. Uh, we also have a pathway that uh, goes down from Ward Street and connects out onto Classical right through there. and. Um, and again, it's just, it's a pretty straightforward request. Thank you very much. We do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. Uh, if you would like to speak, you can uh, please approach the podium, state your name and your address. Um, this is the first of two for Ballantyne Development. This one is, um, as, as Jamel and uh, the applicant have alluded to, this is basically to create um, a single family lot, a um, a couple, actually three other lots within it, all within the same property already. So adding boundary lines and markers uh, to the existing subdivision plans we already have on file. Right. So um, this, this is more of a tidying up what's already been approved previously. That's correct. Okay. Anyone on, on the board have any comments on this one? The only... Um the only comments, question I have, uh, uh, staff discussed two angle points on the roadway design. Uh, I think, can you explain that a little further? Sure. Um, yeah, and I think that's what Carrie was talking about. We met a uh, meeting with staff. That was one of the items we talked about. Um, I know he has um, some reasoning. Um, I think, I guess we get into the weeds a little bit with it. I think... Um, part of the concern, and he can correct me or add to it if I'm wrong, was about traffic calming. But I think because of the minor nature and how those angle points are I, and the fact that you have 90 degree st with stop signs on either end, you're coming from stops from either end, that um, I think the value in having those angle points is 
is less um, for the tr normal traveling public who are going to find and veer into the center of the road. And if they're going to go fast, they're going to go fast in that slight angle. Um, I don't see the larger benefit for traffic calming. What I see is that public works will then, who is actually following the curb line with their plow, having a tighter, it's, it's going to be awkward. Um, and I, so I don't think it'll be awkward for the normal traveling public. I think it'll be awkward for town staff to maintain. So um, that's where I'm willing to continue that conversation with the applicant. And that's where I, I guess I'd suggested to have uh, more conversations with staff on that. Um, so, to try so to work through the issues with the wetland impacts and things like that, that they had brought up as concerns. So with where, changing where are these angle points? Um, on the Ward Street end, um, you can see it kind of does, no, uh, other end. <laughs> yeah, yep. Ward Street right here. No, Ward Street's up here. Yeah. Nope, yeah. Yep, on, on the top. There's, uh, yeah, you can right see there. there's two points that actually, it's right there. rather than right a curve, there. Okay. it's, uh, right. That's what like even on the lower end, there's more of a curve to get out, which yeah. is uh, up there, it's, it's more of this, just, an, it's purely an angle, there's okay. no radius there so that's where I think um, I understand the overall intent um, but I just see it as there might be um, more opportunity to discuss that because I, I think I see it more of an issue with for town staff than it would be slowing traffic down All right, so that's gonna be you know discussed at the staff level and straightened out well, I think we can also discuss it more in the next uh, item, which is particular to site plan. This is okay. really just a subdivision of lots, pretty straightforward. But when we get into the site plan end of it, I think it comes up more there because it's more pertinent to the individual development. Okay. Then the only other quick one uh, pertains to the uh, street, the LED standard lights. What, what do you currently have throughout the property, the whole development? Do, you, uh, the, you don't have these, do you? We just recently put up a number of the lights the town uh, approved, and they were LED. Um, the ones that are in, that we've been putting in for about the last 10 years, are, um, are sodium. But I believe there's, I heard something about that was looking to be changed out. I don't know. But the ones that we just installed, about a dozen of them, those were all LED. Those were the fixture that the town asked us to put in. So we're all set on that? Yeah, the newer phases that are coming on, I think yeah, from same thing. as soon as we converted to LED, that's when the developers started converting or started moving forward. So we kind of drew that line and then moving forward. And so Carrie has been one of our first guinea pigs kind of coming through. And so I appreciate that with um, the work and he's done to kind of coordinate with us and move forward on those newer phases. So that's good. Okay, I'm all set. Thanks. Anyone else? That said, I'll move to approve the project titled Eastern Village Subdivision proposed by Ballantyne Development LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Stantec and Goral Palmer dated 6 19 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the 14th amended plan of the Eastern Village Subdivision includes addition of two adjacent properties, map U43, lot 24, and map U43, lot 25 under common ownership to the subdivision plan. Creation of a new single family lot, which is lot 140, creation of lots 128A, 128B, and 128C, creation of a new right-of-way, Camden Street, connecting Ward Street to Ballantyne Drive. The property is located within the traditional neighborhood development, TND, option overlay, and R4 zoning districts. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan <coughs> adequately addresses the requirements of the subdivision and zoning ordinances. Conditions. One, prior to the signing and release of the MILR, the plan set shall be revised to address the comments in the staff review memo dated 7119 that shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, the existing conditions from the planning board approvals for the 11th, 12th, and 13th amended subdivision plans for Eastern Village will remain in effect. That's the motion. Second, anyone? Second. Rachel seconds it. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Sure, that to be unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item. Ballantyne Development LLC requests a site plan review for lots 128A and 128B, North Village Assessor's Map RO73, lot 21A. Jamal. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so again, Eastern Village, TND Zoning District. Um, the applicant was last before the board in February for a sketch plan review. And the applicant's proposing to construct uh, five three-story multifamily residential buildings consisting of 84 apartments served by a public street. The proposal also includes 21 garages, a community building, dog park, nature trail, and a new public street with sidewalks on both sides. The zoning standards require sidewalks to be connected to pedestrian amenities uh, located in abutting neighborhoods. Staff recommends that the applicant construct a sidewalk along Ward Street to connect the existing sidewalk along Route 1. Uh, this would provide an important pedestrian linkage from the Eastern Village to the municipal and school complex. The applicant has provided building elevations uh, with the submission, uh, so the board should be sure to provide feedback on these designs. And the board approved past subdivision amendments for Eastern Village with the condition that a traffic analysis be completed prior to the development of this phase to confirm traffic volumes to determine if any revisions will be needs made to the approved main DOT permit. This analysis will need to be completed prior to final approval. And the applicant has requested a waiver from the park and aisle width requirement of 25 feet. The applicant is proposing a 20 foot width. However, the town's traffic consultant has recommended the width be no less than 22 feet. And I think Angela would like to address some stormwater comments. Um, I think, um, I guess I just want to touch on um, where the stormwater is actually going. That's been a, a comment or a question um, for this development. It, my understanding is that's going to the existing Valentine Pond. And I guess you guys will correct down on. S small amount. Excuse me? Small amount. But it's collected and headed that direction, not to Bessie Square Pond. Is the That's correct. Correct. OK, so um, with that, though, there has been passed, I guess, another little history or background is um, with the Bessie Square, which is up on Route 1, their stormwater actually is collected and permitted to drain to um, the pond that you'll see south east of the site, yes, over there. <laughs> um, and so with that, there was uh, modifications that needed to be done with that pond in order for water quality and um, quantity. And so with that, you'll see the access road. Um, and I know the trail is now proposed along that sort of alignment. So there'll be changes happening in there. And I, so I just wanted to get an update, I guess, on say the timing of the modifications of that pond, just because it look, it appears that access might be more limited than say it is today. Um, once this development happens and um, that trail gets constructed. So it would be good to get an understanding of where we're at with that. Um, and also more details associated with the grading of that trail because there um, it does cross over uh, a major swale that again conveys the flow from the development up above and so knowing how that coordinates and it will be graded out um, and function in the future would be helpful um, and that's what i have one more thing yes Jamal. thanks angela um, we did receive uh several public uh comments from the from the general public and that has been received and distributed to the board just wanted to throw that out there thank you mm -hmm. All right. uh carrie you're up Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Carrie Anderson, Valentine Development. I'm uh, happy to answer all comments, um, both from peer staff and from uh, the public. Um, not sure where to start, so I guess I'll just dive right in. Steve Bushy is here from uh, Goral Palmer, and he can answer engineering questions. I'd like to get into the one that we just kind of talked about, I guess, last uh, prior to subdivision that Angela was talking about. And there's actually another reason why we are looking for, if you will, deflections in the street. We're trying to create context. Context is really important. We can lose it easily if we don't have it. Uh, it's really a lot of what Eastern Village is based on as well. And the straightening out of this particular uh, area right here and or this one, uh, we lose that pretty quickly. Uh, we like the way we have this deflected shot as we come in here. That's important. When you have straight roads, you don't have you don't terminate them with uh, views of either a terminated vista or a deflected vista. You can lose your context pretty quick. 
So it's really important for us to maintain that. That's also why we've got garages located where they're, they're, they are as well. In addition to that, we have uh, wetlands on the property. We try to avoid them as absolutely most, as much as we could. Um, so the design pays respect to that somewhat as well. And um, I do believe that this particular radius and this centerline radius do meet the town standard currently. We had them at more of a uh, deflection, and in the meeting we had with the town, we were asked to straighten that out, which we did do. We also increased the uh, radius through this area over here, which we, again, want to try and keep as much as we can, but we went with what the town asked us to do there. We also have a road section in Eastern Village that is 44 foot wide right, right away. It's a 20 foot pave, uh, curb to curb, then a six foot esplanade on each side with a five foot sidewalk on each side, and then one foot from edge of sidewalk to property line. We were asked when we met with town uh, a couple months ago if we would um, increase the pavement area from curb to curb from 20 to 22. Uh, we agreed to do that. And uh, we were also asked to reduce that uh, one foot that we lost um, on each side on the esplanade. And I don't know as we necessarily agreed to that, but what I am uh, suggesting that we do is we would like that one foot put back in the esplanade. It will be a tree-lined street. And we would essentially have properly properly line right at edge of sidewalk. So that's something that we um, want to have in that 44 foot wide section as well as going from a 20 foot curb to curb as you currently see in most of Eastern Village now go to a uh, 22 foot uh, curb to curb. With that uh, the other things that I can uh, talk about is um, in the uh, in the request is um, we, it is five buildings. Uh, there are two 24 unit buildings, three 12 unit buildings. The 12 unit buildings are all one bedroom. The 24 unit have some twos and mostly ones. The uh, site has also got a, um, a building that will be our post office, a building that will be community space, which we may have a gym or some other type of functional space and um, and also uh, some storage buildings which will look architecturally um, a little different from the buildings themselves but they will be wood frame pitched roof and they will be for people who uh, request uh, some type of storage we get that a lot i would say probably 60 to 70 percent of the people that are living in south village uh, have requested that in some form so we do have some of those the garages we've also got as kind of a further amenity. We are looking at it as being a project that has more amenities and uh, of a little better quality than South Village, just in terms of some of the amenities. It also has a dog park, which has, um, we've gotten a lot of feedback on that. Off leash is really important, even though we're in a walkable neighborhood. <clears throat> and we bought the Eastern Trail for uh, most of the project, there are still people who are looking for off-leash as more and more of the laws that come in today require people to keep their dogs on leashes. Uh, so some of the comments that came in from, um, from peer review about snow storage and whatnot, we will take a look at that, but we, um, we think we've got a pretty good uh, handle on that, but we certainly will uh, take another look at that. And, um, With that, I guess I'll turn it over to Steve Bushy for um, maybe some of the engineering questions. I'm happy to get into um, any of the co any of the uh, uh, issues that the public have raised. And um, uh, the only thing I'll say is it's a uh, well located project with uh, ample road network and utilities, and and uh, it's really the best place for what we're proposing. Thank you, Carrie. Um, 
before I open up for public comment, I am going to make a, a note here that items 15 and 16 uh, will not be heard tonight. We've got about 12 minutes left before. So if you were here for uh, Eau Claire Hair Care or uh, Jay Chatmus, these items will not be addressed tonight. They will be placed on the next agenda. All right. Uh, so with that, uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment. If anyone here would like to get up and speak, just ask that you introduce yourself. You're going to keep your comments to no more than three minutes, please. I like to give a little courtesy tap when you got 30 seconds left. So that means wind it down. All right, guys? Thank you. My name is Stephanie Smith. I live on Audubon Way, which is right across from where that new road will be coming in. Um, I have about uh, four or five very issues that I will get into very quickly once I get them brought up on my phone so I remember the ball. Um, I'm concerned about traffic. I'm particularly concerned about traffic on Valentine. People already go too fast on Valentine, and that will be one of the major entrances to this whole area. I don't know if there's some things that can be done to slow traffic down on Valentine. I hate speed bumps, but maybe it's time to start considering something like that. The other, the, the next thing I have is a concern that it doesn't appear that Ward Street is going to go all the way through to where Inspiration and Classical come together at that intersection, and it would seem to me that makes some sense to do to um, alleviate some of the traffic. Um, I, uh, Carrie mentioned wetlands. I know there are some wetlands in there, and I hope that the DEP is taking a look at this whole project to make sure that we're saving those wetlands as best as possible. Um, also, I, I understand from the discussion that some of the, the storm water is going into a different pond, but how much of it, if any of it, is going into the pond behind Audubon, and for how long? Because that's a concern. And lastly, um, there's been a lot of work done on Eastern Village to make the houses attractive and the, and the, the um, landscape attractive until they built the South Village. And those buildings are ugly. And these buildings look to be the same, the apartment buildings. And frankly, they're ugly. They don't fit the, the ambience that has been created in the Eastern Village. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we could uh, not do any applauding, that would one save some time, and two, you know, it's, you know, you could cheer internally. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, my name is Portia Hirschman. I am a resident of Eastern Village, and my house is down where Ballantyne intersects with um, Inspiration. So I'll be looking almost from this same direction. Um, my concerns are three. One is that work that has already begun needs to be completed. The new entrance needs to be done down on Eastern Road. Uh, trees need to be done, finished on classical and reflection. Uh, Off-street parking areas haven't been finished and so on. Um, is getting some of this work done before we start yet in with another bit of, of uh, construction. The other issue for me is density. Um, Eastern Village, as I understand it, was originally approved to be a higher density location based upon the provision of affordable housing. And I haven't seen affordable housing showing up in any numbers. And so I'm concerned about that. It, it should be there. Um, but the density is, is really an issue. I mean, we're potentially looking at 160 more cars in the neighborhood. We've got children. The school bus picks our kids up on Commerce. We've got children who have to walk through the neighborhood and up Valentine to catch the school bus. Now, all of a sudden, we've got all these cars going in two different directions. Uh, I'm really concerned about that. But density, it's changing the whole nature of, of Eastern Village. Our prior commenter talked about the nature of the houses, and these buildings are not with the standard of Eastern Village at all. And it's, it's very concerning for us homeowners and, um, and 
the concern for the safety. Also, I wonder about the wetlands, because a lot of this is wetlands, and the snow storage, and what the impact is on the wetlands, and what is being done to protect wetland areas from um, further disruption. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Tom Atkinson, and I live on Audubon Way as well. I agree with uh, everything that Portia and Stephanie had to say. Just uh, a couple of elaborations, I guess. Uh, we'd be very concerned in, to the addition of traffic, but specifically to the addition of heavy construction traffic going down Ballantyne Way. I don't even think it'll fit under the trees now. Uh, we have lots of kids. We have lots of dog walkers. We have lots of bikers. Uh, we finally have a paved road. I would hate to see dump truck after dump truck going down that road. It just ruins the neighborhood. Uh, I think it's a safety issue as well. So I'm not gonna repeat the same thing they said about mm -hmm. the volume of traffic. We all can do the math of apartments time by times cars and it's just gonna increase. The other thing I'm concerned about is uh, stormwater drain off going into uh, Ballantyne Pond. That pond is already becoming more shallow. There are Cattails growing in places where cattails didn't grow before. The, the, the slope of the pond, instead of being vertical, is now slanted. It's filled up with silt, a lot of plant material. I also suspect it's uh, runoff from the roads. Uh, the pond is, uh, could be uh, something attractive for the neighborhood. I think it's on the, the verge of being a, an eyesore. The more water that goes into it, the more stuff that runs off the roadway, it's I don't see how it can make it worse. So I would like to see those two uh, issues, traffic and stormwater into Ballantyne Pond, uh, be discussed more. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Chris McGee. Uh, I'm gonna stand back. I'm hard of hearing, so I kind of shout. I don't wanna overwhelm you guys. Um, I just moved to Scarborough. Uh, I retired from the Air Force after 20 years. This is the first time I got to pick where I wanted to live, and I picked Scarborough. If I could have moved here sooner, I would have. It's beautiful. And I love it, so hello, neighbors. Um, also, I have not been able to engage in municipal uh, elections or any sort of politics. I was a resident of California, stationed all over the country. So this is my first time engaging in municipal activities. So I'm pretty ignorant. I'll do my best. Uh, my primary concern, I live right at the end of Ward Street, is uh, right up near uh, Route 1. My primary concern is traffic and whether the traffic can, uh, the Ward Street can handle that flow of traffic. So first of all, you have the unoccupied, looks, looks like it was a prior church. I don't know if that's gonna be a church again, but I'm worried that any, any traffic surveys we do won't, in, won't necessarily include the traffic that's gonna be coming and going from that. Uh, the second thing is, um, I'm not sure, and I'm certainly not an expert, but Ward Street, right at the outlet to Route 1, doesn't have a turn lane of any kind, so if you're talking about a track up back up down Ward Street. Um, my ignorance is probably showing here, but I'm gonna assume that the majority of the traffic leaving the development is gonna be coming down Ward Street, headed towards the 295 and the Scarborough connector to Portland, so higher density up north compared to the south. Um, but it sounds like the residents uh, along the southern or southwestern roadway is already looking at high traffic and high speeds. So it looks like it would be a competition between the Ward neighborhood and the south southwestern neighborhood, and everybody's kind of at uh, traffic capacity. So my request would be just an exhaustive traffic survey of this, and I would ask that it's also not in a vacuum that it considers the increase of traffic on Route 1 from Scarborough Downs development, as well as the Scarborough, uh, excuse me, as well as the Route 1 uh, survey that they're doing as well. I would like for that to be considered. So if those things are the standard course of action, I'm just telling you what you already know to do. I apologize, but thanks for hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Norma Weinberg, and um, two years ago, really five years ago, we started looking in Maine to move from New York, and we came to Eastern Village, and we kept leaving Eastern Village, and we kept coming back to Eastern Village, and we bought in Eastern Village, and we bought in Eastern Village because of the uniqueness of the homes, the beauty of it, and the community that was already here. Um, I have a new puppy. I'm out there day and night walking my dog and the traffic that comes through from Black Point Road 
and goes into what I consider the back 40 of the homes beyond Eastern Village is unbelievable. And they come out of that way and they go back through Black Point Road or they go up through my, I live on Two Valentine, I'm the White House with the flagpole. So they also turn right and go up Commerce, but they've come through and they go up. So this is a big cut through road. And I've noticed in my walking, um, I've seen dead turtles on the road now that I didn't see a year ago. Um, I tried to pick up a snapping turtle, but I couldn't get close enough because it was gonna bite me. Um, but it had come from uh, the, the new, this new area over here, and it was trying to get to the, uh, the pond, Valentine Pond. And I see this all the time. I see deers, I see skunks, I see possums. Um, I've seen red foxes, and I've seen thousands, well not thousands, but a ton of turkeys. And I'm worried that with this going in, with all the traffic, where are they gonna go? You know, we are not the only ones on this planet. There's wildlife that we have to consider too. And I agree, I agree with the comments about, I don't, the plans on that I thought were for Eastern Village for the South Apartments were these gabled, cute, really cute little buildings. And I said, those go, those go with our neighborhood. They look great. And what was put up looked like army barracks. And I grew up in the army. My father was an army officer. I know what they look like. And they're these, I'm sorry, they're ugly white buildings. And I don't want to see that going up right behind us again. I, you know, I, I don't want to see that. I want to see something pretty. And they're, they're really on the property line. I mean, these people that bought in that area, they didn't know those were going up. And they're going up and, and they're right next to those homes. And I'm sure people don't want those that live there. They don't want to have to look at that. They want their privacy. They don't want those homes looking into their, their houses and their yards. And I mean, most of us don't even have fences. L luckily, I back up to Scarborough property. I have trees behind me, but all the other people don't. There's nothing back there. and they. That's what they're going to see. They're going to look out their back windows, and there's no privacy there anymore. There's going to be a big buildings. Good evening. My name is Ellen Lyon. I live on Audubon Way, and I just would like you very much to take concern of that water and where that water is going to go. I live on Audubon Way, and there's times that we cannot walk on the property because there is so much water. And where is the water that's being, going to be dispersed when all this is just up the way from us? So please look into the wetlands, look into the water where it's going to go. And also, of course, the traffic. Traffic is very important. Um, my final thing is the buildings that are down by south I think it's called South something, what everyone else is talking about. I drove by them today. It looks terrible down there. The dirt, it looks like um, it needs some tender loving care, that's for sure. And I'd like to see that done before anything else is really started in Eastern Village. It would definitely make people's lives a lot better and what you have to look at every day a lot better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Rick Hirschman. Um, my wife spoke earlier. We live at uh, Inspiration in Valentine and looked directly as you, though we were going to be looking up there. Um, I have sat here this evening and I've heard th this uh, board talk about the aesthetics of a lot of buildings, including the siding on the church and so forth. I don't know whether or not you have seen Southern Village or whatever it's called, the other the apartments that have, have been built. Um, everyone in Eastern Village calls them the barracks because that's what they look like. 
And I've had two people that go to our church that ask me, what are, what are those barracks doing? Now, and I didn't, had not used that word with them. So it's not, they are, they are quite an ugly edifice. And I, I, have, I was sighted by Carrie because I put up a satellite dish and you could see four inches of the edge of it up from the street. People have to get permits to change the color of their front door in Eastern Village. And yet, the pictures and the drawings of the buildings that were going to be at Southern Village that were shown to the people who bought in Eastern Village, were, some of them were nice, nice looking buildings, but they are nothing like what was built there. And I think if you're looking at the aesthetics of what goes into the town of Scarborough, you need to start looking at the aesthetics of these apartments that are proposed here. There is no charm to them. We have extensive woodwork and framing and everything else in the houses in Eastern Village, and they look quite attractive. Every single house is trimmed differently. And all of these apartments have no charm. And, and I, it's hard for me to say because I know everybody has different taste, but if you haven't seen Southern Village or whatever it's called and you haven't seen these plans and you haven't driven through Eastern Village, I encourage you to do that because they do not belong in this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that would like to speak this evening? I won't take a lot of time because, and I agree with everything that's been said, but I am Brenda Frost and I live on Valentine Drive and we moved there before there was Eastern Village. And Carrie, in the closing, Carrie Anderson said to us, there will be no houses built across the street from you. So oh, that lasted a couple of a couple of years, and now we have seven or eight, and now we're going to have this whole thing. And my biggest thing, I worry about safety with the traffic, because already we have how many families in Eastern Village? 150, and often two cars. So all of that traffic has to come through Valentine because they can't get out um, through um, the other exit because you can't take a left, there's no light. You take your life in your hands if you get out of Eastern Village down by South Village. You can't, it, it rarely can be done. So all of that traffic comes through Valentine and I'm really concerned about more traffic coming through and I guess my wish would be that it wouldn't happen, but the um, biggest thing is safety in our neighborhood. And, and I agree with the beauty, but um, the traffic, something has to be done about the traffic. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm Janelle Carlson. I live on Audubon Way. I'm going to continue the traffic thought. I have a copy of a letter from Brenda, who just spoke with you. It was dated 2011. It was the same problem. The excessive traffic, buildings not going to be built, which then were, I have talked before, I believe it was this board, not the town council, about Valentine Drive and the safety. A woman who lived on Valentine Drive was at her mailbox 
getting her mail. She slipped on the ice, and people drove by. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. She slipped on the, she, she didn't slip on the ice, she fell, because we're an elderly group on Audubon and that circle. Trucks and cars went past her and did not slow nor stop to help her get up. I've seen other people slip and fall on that road. We spoke about traffic um, speed signs. I remember you were saying, Carrie, that we were under construction. All those heavy trucks were going through, so we, at that point, signage could not be erected. Well, that amount of signage, I think, is more needed now than ever. And I'm looking at people who live on Valentine. You've heard from people who live on Valentine. Another difficulty, and perhaps this one could be addressed without too much inconvenience to the new part. The trucks that have to come through to service our landscaping, you know how big they are, and they're carrying enormous trailers. They have to park because the roads are narrow, the other roads. They park on Valentine while they're working, and they're there for extended periods of time. So all the other traffic has to circle around them. Not with a safety situation, could be when the kids are coming home from school or the parents are running to pick them up. The kids who are walking, who are left off on commerce, almost always, from what I have observed, are really good about staying either on the very side of the road, and those might be high school age kids. The younger ones are stay using the sidewalks. The children are not the problem. The people who are going to go to pick them up sometimes are excessive in the speed with which they're driving. Not everybody stops out at the, with a stop sign at Commerce. So, you know, these are, these are details that need to be addressed. Thank you for considering. Thank you. I'm Gail Sweat, and I live at 15 Valentine Drive. We were among the very first people to move into the beautiful community, and one of the reasons we chose it was because it felt so safe. Uh, and I was listening to someone talk about our Constitution and how in our Constitution we are supposed to be guaranteed by our leadership uh, safety in our own communities, in our own world. And personally, I don't feel very safe on Valentine Drive most days. As I watch my wife walk across the street each morning with our dog and putting her hands up to traffic saying, slow down, slow down. We've called the fire department, we've called the police, we've talked to people here, and we have gotten no response. We're asking for help with traffic patterns, and now we're going to get hundreds of new people coming into our community. Uh, and I, I've been sitting here thinking, I don't want to sound like somebody who is an older person, who is a naysayer, because we have growth happening in our community. When we were with Carrie at our closing, and he told us he wanted to have a community that felt like the Western Promenade, and we had been living on the Western Prom while we were waiting for our beautiful condo to be built, and he explained how safe it was going to be because the streets would never have yellow lines, and they don't have those, but they also don't have speed limits, and they also have uh, the most hideous apartment buildings. I've driven all over town and seen beautiful new complexes. And when we pull into our community off of Black Point Road, I'm embarrassed I, to show people from out of town who've come to visit our gorgeous community. And I apologize 
because they're so hideous. I hope all of you drive through there tonight on your way home and take a look at those hideous buildings. And I just want you to know, I'm all for growth in Scarborough and having a beautiful community with beautiful homes of all different types of apartment buildings that are beautiful. They can be beautiful. Carrie builds a gorgeous home. But what happened when it came to the apartments? Please help us with that and help us with the traffic so that we can feel safe in our own community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to get up and speak? All right, seeing none, I'm going to close public comments and we'll jump into it. Jen, you want to start this one off for us? Not to step on the chair's toes at all, but I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in thanking those of you for sitting here for as long as you have to um, take your few minutes and let us know how you feel. It's really important input for us um, to hear from all of you, and I know it's been a long night for, for all of us, but all, for all of you too, so thanks for being patient. Um, <clears throat> I do have some questions on... Um, <coughs> Okay, I'll start with the roadway. Where's my plan? Okay. <clears throat> the um, I'm curious why the okay, you're looking at that too. Um, the dry vials so f so focusing at um, the two angle points that were mentioned earlier. There are some offshoots, for lack of a better term. Um, driveways perhaps that come off of that main road that you're proposing so so these sections like um, that the ones with the buildings at the top G2 and G3 um, and then on the on the top of the page G3 and G4 why those are skewed for context okay um, and whether or not and so I'm not, um, I just have the, uh, the staff review comment letter about the angle points in general, but I'm curious whether or not you looked at um, a, larger, a larger radius here that might replace the two angle points. Uh, well, these angle points right here, we straightened those out a fair amount from what we originally wanted and we do not want straight. Uh, that will increase speed, make things less safe. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did do what the uh, town staff had asked us to do. These radius points out here, we also increased, which we also did not want to do. That will increase speeds. But we increased those so that uh, fire trucks and larger vehicles could move and maneuver that more easily. Now in the auto turn analysis, it worked at what we had, but we increased it because we were asked to. Okay, and I noticed that the de there was a detail in the plan set that called, so the typical roadway cross-section called for either um, vertical granite curb or sloped uh, slope form. Yes. Slope concrete curbing. <clears throat> um, curious if you could, are those in different areas or are you just preserving the option to use one or the other? Town asked us to use concrete. We don't care. We'll do either or. Are you proposing any other improvements to Ward Street in addition to the item, um, the topic that's been brought up about sidewalk, but any other, um, any other plans to look at that? We don't have any plans right now to do anything other than the improvements we already already done in Ward Street. We own a person, we have a fee interest in a portion of Ward Street. Uh, it's one of the reasons why this part of the project was um, kind of held off until we could gain ownership of Ward Street. Um, we have that and have had that, but there's also issues with going up Ward Street. There need to be eminent domain takings 
to make some of that work. Um, it really puts us at a disadvantage in terms of trying to work some of those things out. The town would have a uh, better uh, go of getting that stuff accomplished. It's not really kind of straightforward. There's a lot of kind of difficult things up on Ward Street that have to be looked at and taken into account. It's not, you know, kind of simply running it up one side uh, straight up to Route 1 or anything else like that. So we, had, we were uh, going to have a discussion with staff more about that particular item. We just hadn't gotten to that point yet. Okay. Is Ward, Angela's Ward Street or Jamal, you know, a fully a public way to this point? Um, I think you'll see on the plan there's a line that shows where, I don't know, you can't see it on this plan maybe, but on one of the plans okay. in your packet, it does end oh, yeah. short of this intersection that we're showing. Um, and that's what I think Carrie is just referring to. And that then it ends right there, essentially. Right, so we only own to there. So, and, we, and the town has an easement over it. We actually have the fee interest in it. I do personally. Uh, so one question that I have after hearing a lot of the public input was about, so there's obviously a problem, or at the very least a perceived problem, with um, cut through traffic through the existing part of this neighborhood. And I was just wondering if um, you could maybe give any thought on what you think that is. I understand that there's still um, construction activity going on, so obviously there would be the presence of construction traffic, but um, I'm curious and trying to sort out in my own head about whether or not the tr some of the traffic and speeding and parking issues that have been mentioned are from other residents that we're not hearing from, or are there other people that we think are using this as a cut through? I think there are some cut-throughs that go through there. We tried in the original design to implement a lot of measures that would discourage that, but it still happens. Yeah. Um, I will be right up front and tell you I'm perplexed by this supposed traffic problem down there. With the exception of the gentleman that spoke from Ward Street, every one of those individuals is retired along with 90% of the other people that live down there, and they simply don't go to work. They don't work. It place a ghost town. I've said to staff uh, for the last two or three years, if you want a traffic count, let me know. I'm happy to do it because it's going to show a uh, credit to me, um, given what it was approved based on single family, based on uh, occupants that would be along the lines of families. We wanted families. We still want families. We don't get families. We get uh, elderly people, and, um, and they don't drive. Um, so not during peak hour. You might want to open public conversations. Guys, you've had your chance to speak. We're now going to let the applicant speak, please. Thank you. So, um, you know, we're comfortable with where that will all shake out. Um, but, um, you know, we can't do anything about the cut-throughs. That's more of an enforcement issue. The roads are incipient dedication. So uh, what hasn't been accepted will be accepted. And I frankly think it's a police matter. Speed bumps is not the answer, uh, nor do we want them. Um, again, putting in some of the measures that we have put in and also we're asked to take out on North Village are going to do better uh, at calming the traffic than, than anything else. But, um, you know, I don't, there's a lot of construction that's going on down there. There's a lot of vehicles that are construction when it's fully built out and it's just uh, occupied by uh, the demographic. It's, um, you know, it'll be less for sure. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I guess. Um do you just want those kind of general comments and then collect input on certain items at the end? I think, um, you know, clearly he's, he's going to, you're going to have to go back and uh, rework some of this based off of staff comments and, and any other comments that you may come across tonight. I think the, um, <clears throat> if there are big questions that we want to provide him some input um, and staff as well might need some direction from this board. Sure. 
Um, I would echo both the staff comment and Bill Bray's comment on the importance of a sidewalk connection um, along Ward Street. That comes out at one of um, only a few signalized crossings that we have for Route 1. Um, and that feeds into, you know, the larger municipal campus on the other side. Um, and so, f you know, for that reason, I think it's really, it's a terrific opportunity to provide pedestrian infrastructure along there. I recognize that because of land issues, <laughs> right of ways, things like that, that it may not be um, as straightforward as maybe in, in some other cases, but um, I just, I would agree that that is, is an important thing to flush out a little bit further anyway. Um, also, the um, I I I'm not um, so I I too struggle with the angle points in the road, and I think that probably in your next iteration, I, I think that there's middle ground there in terms of meeting your your desire for some context here and not having this just be a, you know, a straight shot um, highway, but also um, really wanting to make this um, a safe and um, functioning street in terms of maintenance and operations, emergency vehicles and all those types of things. Um, so I would just, you know, I, I'm confident that the staff will continue to work with you on that. Um, and I would just look forward to the next iteration there. Thanks, Jen. Roger. Um, I'm kind of curi uh, curious. Um, is it appropriate to allow Terry to respond to some of the comments from the public, or how do you feel about that? I, I would prefer to see us incorporate some of the feedback we've received into questions that we can ask Terry. Okay. I think, uh, for I'll give you a perfect example. This question that's on my my mind. Based on the feedback you've heard here tonight, is there any intention on your part to perhaps reconsider some of the architecture being proposed, whether it be through colors or different trim work or some sort of other points of interest? Like that. Okay. Well, with respect to South Village, the architecture is not done, uh, or not the architecture, the landscaping is not done. So, yeah, when you drive over there, it's dirt. Um, and that's not going to be done until all the work is done. Um, the last building will be completed by probably around the middle of August. Project's fully leased up. So that work will take place as far as the entrance goes off of Eastern Road. We didn't get approval on that until earlier this year. So we really couldn't do that until we had an approval on that. We've been wanting to straighten that out for a while, but needed to uh, make sure that we uh, could go forward the way that we did. And, um, you know, I, I don't uh, agree with them at all. The architecture on North Village is a federal style architecture. Um, you know, it's got three feet of trim from the eave down to the uh, highest top of the highest window. Nobody does that. Most people, if they put anything, put one piece of trim on there. We've got, mul we've got you know, double freezes. Um, and, um, you know, there's enough windows in them. We could take windows out, but we don't want to do that. So, yeah, they're full of windows. Um, I don't see us really, you know, we're proposing the North Village colors to be of a main vernacular. So they would be white with red roofs, which is Portland Headlight. Uh, several other structures you've seen around Maine with that color scheme, and we're looking to stay that way. We don't want to make them multiple and we want them to be white with, uh, with, with red roofs or green roofs. But green was more along the lines of what they would build barns with that vernacular, you know. Um, so, um, you know, we can talk about it, but I don't see us deviating from pulling out windows, dropping ceiling heights to lower the building down or doing any of those things that frankly will make it look worse. Um, we're trying to keep along the lines of a clean federal style architecture, and that's what it is. And uh, that's what South Village is, too. It's the floor is still yours. Sorry. You, you asked all my questions. <laughs> I asked a question. No, um, what, I'm kind of, what I'm curious I mean, about. 
not, not to interrupt, but I'm happy to go down through the comments that came from public as soon as we're ready to talk about those. Um, but however you want to uh, take those as you, as, you, as you want to or you want me to. No, I think we're going to stick with the, the board will incorporate some of the feedback from the audience into our questioning, and we'll leave it at that. Um, okay. Um, I, yes, I'm kind of curious, uh, Carrie, is the, um, the buildings that are in the South Village, and I'm, I'm going to kind of weave some of the comments in here. Um, those, those buildings as proposed, as I recall them, uh, are they actually what has been built? Yes. Yep, absolutely. What's been built is exactly what was approved and what, through came, and what came through this board uh, for several meetings. Absolutely. Because uh, uh, I, uh, I have seen those buildings a few times. And, for instance, on some of the buildings, and I'm, I'm assuming you're going to do something similar to this on the North Village um, regarding the building design. I'm not sure what that trim there called have a particular name. Yeah. The, um, you know, where the, the, the peak of the roof goes up, there's a piece of trim that goes across. Mm -hmm. What is it? Is that what it's called? You're talking about broken pediment versus full pediment. Right. Yeah, the building. The full, the full pediment, then, when yeah. the building doesn't have that. Going one, across, one, of, one of the buildings down on Eastern Road doesn't have it. The, the uh, white and green uh, building. Uh, doesn't have it, wasn't supposed to have it. Yeah. It's kind of a different building in and of itself. Uh, the, uh, the four buildings that are kind of more in on the side away from Eastern Road, those are full pediment buildings. Um, again, it's federal architecture. Uh, it's got one uh, horizontal trim board for a freeze rather than uh, dual freezes like this particular building does, these buildings do rather. Um, but, um, you know, the only thing I think that looks uh, a little different or not as good as it could look down on South Village is some of those buildings down there are six unit buildings. Um, so they're a uh, small floor plate, but they're three stories. Uh, but the buildings that are bigger, uh, they look better proportionately. Uh, the buildings in North Village are along the lines of the bigger buildings. Um, that is the only thing that, uh, that um, you know, but we were trying to separate the buildings. We were trying to create, you know, green space and whatnot too. We were trying to frame a square with those four buildings over there. And, um, but that's, you know, that's it. Again, there's no architecture there, architect or landscaping rather. Landscaping still needs to be done. Everything needs to be graded up, needs to be landscaped. Um, so it's, you know, it's not a good testament to the way it'll eventually look uh, with respect to the site, but the architecture is, uh, it's a federal style architecture. Is, are you using the same architect for the... <laughs> no, North Village is a different architect. Okay. Um, I mean, I, li I like the layout of what you're doing in the North Village. Um, I, I think what you've done throughout Eastern Village looks really nice. I, I like the buildings. I like I like the color schemes, uh, landscaping, and everything, but I, I do agree with the audience that um, those those uh, units at East at the South Village, um, they just this they just don't blend in with everything else, and I would I would really not like to see the same very similar thing occurring at the North Village. I think it would, you know. Um, um, well, we can get into discussion about the differences of and have more of a discussion about the architecture if you want. Um, but I think that you'll see, given that North Village is, you know, the smaller ones are the 12 unit sizes, those are better proportionately. Hmm. Um, you, you talked about the, um, the Eastern, Eastern Trail Black Point Road intersection a few minutes ago. What's, maybe Angela may know more about this. What's going on with that intersection? There was, wasn't there supposed to be some improvements to that? I'm sorry. Uh, at, is that what you're referring to down at Eastern? Yeah, Eastern Road? Trail. Eastern, yeah, Eastern right, Road. I think Carrie mentioned before that the, they were in front of the board and got approval to realign that. But we're holding money through a letter of credit, or it might be an escrow. Cash. Escrow. Um, 
for the improvements associated, that was part of phase three, I believe. So um, is that? That's getting done when, uh, when the site contractor comes back. Okay, is that when the, um, the access to the um, Eastern Village, will, you know, that road will be straight? The realignment, yes. Yeah, that'll all occur at the same yeah. time? Yeah, I saw a comment in public uh, uh, comments about that. I'll, I'll agree and admit that uh, the upkeep of the uh, road, which is partially gravel where it connects onto Eastern Road, could be better kept up. I will admit that. Um, when we do go out there and grade it up, it isn't three days later. We've got potholes back. We could do a better job, 100%. But uh, we've left that down there like that until we got the realignment approved, which we just did earlier this year. And uh, when the site contractor comes back here in the next few weeks, they're going to make the realignment connection, uh, make the improvements down towards uh, Black Point Road. Um, as well as do some other work in Eastern Village. Um, okay, I don't want to dwell on the South Village anymore. Um, did you, now, when you were before the board before on the North Village, you were talking about a, a potential other road leading down to Inspiration Drive, where that trail, similar to where that trail is? So you're talking about this one right here? Yes. Yeah, so we had uh, originally, uh, we originally were going to build that, and uh, some of the comments we got, we had, we had a neighborhood meeting, I believe it was last September, maybe October of last year, we held a neighborhood meeting uh, to talk about North Village, and uh, we made changes that we got from the, the homeowners uh, that we felt we could make that didn't, um, you know, obviously some people don't want it built, so we're not going to do that. But uh, and the things that we could do as far as putting the buildings a little bit further away from some of the uh, homeowners that live down here on these two roads, uh, we responded to that. We, um, again, trying to keep some of the same context we've got in Eastern Village. Um, so we made some of those changes. And uh, one of the things that came out of that is one of the homeowners asked that this road not be connected up right now. I actually wanted to put it on the plan, on the subdivision plan that that would at a later date and time be a uh, public way. And staff asked me to, uh, unless I was gonna bring something forward at this time, to not uh, put that on the plan, because I wanna make sure that everybody knew about it. Um, I have never told anybody that this land was never gonna be developed or any of that stuff that's been said tonight. And in an effort to make sure that people have absolute full disclosure, have notes like that on the plan. But again, we were asked to not do that unless we were going to propose it at this time. So right now, it's just proposed to be a pedestrian connection. So, so basically, with the original plan, the access points were going to be Commerce Drive. Ward Street, Ward Eastern Street. Road. Yeah, we've got two other locations where we can put entrances too. That's what I was going to ask you next. Yes, yeah, so we came to the board, you know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, in our three or four year permitting process when we were working everything out on this project. And we, we came to the board and we said, all right, we have, we've got five ways in. When I bought the property, there was none. And I created five ways to get into it. And I said, um, you know, we'd like to go forward with at least four of them. And of course, there were people there that objected to it going, you know, this way or that way, and usually where they lived. And uh, it came down to uh, Ballantyne, Ward Street, and Eastern Road. And I'll also say that our traffic movement permit that we have for the number of trips and units in the project uh, works without the connection to Ward Street. So Ward Street isn't even needed based on the trip gen numbers that we had, based on it being a single family project, which it is, but the demographic is completely different. Um, but what we are, what there would be after this project is built is this connection through to Ward Street and then this pedestrian connection here that may at a later date become a road. I guess, um I guess I'll leave it at that right now. Thanks, Roger. Rachel? Yeah. Um, 
There we go. I, I want to hold on the architecture for a minute, although I'll have a couple of comments about that, and take a look at the, um, the complex that you've got. I really don't have an issue with the angles. I, I do think uh, it will calm traffic a little bit. Uh, I think it provides um, more of a neighborhood sense than a straight road would look like. But I do have some concerns or questions about the arrangement of the buildings and the garage, some of the garages. Now, some of the garages open up, it looks like, directly onto the street uh, rather than into a parking lot. And that raises the question of people getting out and backing out into a street where there's likely to be traffic. Um, so I would ask you to take a look at that <clears throat> because I, I do think that that does create a safety issue. Um, I also have a question about the way a couple of the buildings, and it would be unit two, unit four, um, really aren't connected to the parking lots, which would be forcing people to walk down the sidewalk uh, or through a parking lot carrying groceries, whatever it is that they're coming from their cars, whereas the uh, other buildings at least have a direct connection to a, a parking lot and a sidewalk in the parking lot. So I would ask you to take a look at that. Um, in terms of the architecture, I have a note on one of these, uh, one of the <coughs> building schemes came out of that says uh, army barracks. Uh, and I know somebody else uh, used that same term. Um, there are army barracks that I've seen that are in the federal style and they're still army barracks. And I do see the, uh, the work that you've done or your architect has done around the, the detailing. It's still kind of lost uh, in, in the design. The federal buildings that were straight and built kind of four square or um, in, a, in a rectangle just simply weren't as big as the buildings that you're proposing here. So as you start to expand the scale, that straight line with window lineups um, really starts to dominate and the details that you're putting in uh, get lost. And I would in really encourage you to take a look at some variation You've got some variation in building three and five in terms of um, L's and, and shadows. I think you need to, to reconsider what you mean by federal and think instead as we start to think about New England vernacular. Throughout New England, federal buildings were added on to colonial buildings and revolutionary buildings and were added on a Victorian addition was added on. Uh, and very, very few buildings in New England ended up pure. And if you go around um, a town square, you will see buildings that started off as the straight federal and then had additions put, them, put on them that really worked with that architecture. So consider, uh, perhaps your, your architect could use uh, his or her imagination and say, what would happen if I started with a federal building and then the family expanded and I added on? How would that start to create, instead of a, a group of five buildings, create a village center um, that's composed of these apartments? And, and I really encourage you to, to look at that. Uh, I've I've heard what the folks here have said about their concerns about the architecture. I think you do pay a great deal of attention to that. I think you pay a great deal of attention to the, uh, to the details. But I think what's proposed here just doesn't quite work, and given the scale of these buildings. And I'd, I'd ask you to really take a, 
take a hard look at that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Rick? <coughs> not, much, not much more to add. Um, I will say that I spent 22 years in the Navy. Maybe I should have been in the Army because those aren't bad looking barracks. Thank you. But we agree. <laughs> that being said, I, my real concern is I'll let go uh, the garages and the potential of pulling out into a uh, road that may have um, some additional traffic because it's a, it's a cut through road, for example. Uh, so I, I would ask that that kind of be looked at, uh, maybe moved it. Um, but other than that, I think you've heard a lot. I mean, there's a lot on the staff review here that we'll bring out in the next round, um, such as the photometrics and, and lighting details and uh, such as that, that I won't take any more time. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, I too. I mean, I'll just echo what has already been said here. I'm, I'm going to highlight a couple of things that I am in complete agreement with. Uh, Rachel had brought up a couple of good points uh, regarding the garages, uh, the parking access to those buildings two and four. Um, I think I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think there's probably a little more work that could be done there for the benefit of the people who are going to live there. Uh, I am. I'm going to also weigh in. Uh, you had a couple of waiver requests. Um, the 20 foot. Uh, 20 foot width. Uh, I think I heard you say you were uh, okay with the 22, which is what uh, Traffic Solutions Bill Bray has suggested as a minimum. Did I, did I not hear that? No, you did hear it. We agreed in a meeting that we had with Angela that we could accommodate 22. Okay. And then um, the uh, waiver for the 90 foot separation between driveways. We haven't um, addressed that as a board. And I'm going to ask uh, Jamel if you could just highlight the areas that are of your concern on this, or Angela, whoever, whoever had the note. It's the requested waiver section, requesting a waiver from the required 90 foot of separation between driveways along the street with a speed limit of 25 miles or less. Um, I is, guess. Is it all of them? I, it could be. <laughs> uh, it's definitely at least more than one. Um, the applicant has a, they're trying to calm traffic. Certainly more driveways will do that. Um, so that's a discussion to be had. Okay. Um, that, that doesn't have to go anywhere at this moment, does it? I think we could see the next round before something that, that waiver is considered or no. It would be better to get it now out of the way, just in general. Thinking out loud, um, probably should give him some guidance on this if he's going to have to redraw something. I think he'd let, rather do it earlier on in the process. So, yeah. Uh, Carrie, do you know off the top of your head which um, driveways at this point aren't 90 feet separation? You know, these right here, and we don't want to line. You're a little too quick. Can you hold that up? Sorry, for yeah, these right here. Yeah, no, we, we, don't, we don't want to line them up. We specifically want them uh, staggered, skewed. Um, that's what Eastern Village is. That's what we, um, those are some of the geometrics that we, we got into the design of Eastern Village. We, again, we don't want to line those up for a reason, contextual reason. Uh, can I just get a quick straw poll out of the board? Who's okay with the current layout as proposed versus who wants to see the 90 feet of separation at a minimum. Got two. Mine is proposed. And Jen looks hesitant. It's okay to be the lone man on the ledge. I've been there. <laughs> okay. Um, I too am okay with the proposed uh, design and layout. So, um, and then I did have another note here. Oh yes, my big underlined note. I concur with staff. The sidewalk getting to Route One, I believe, is important and is something you should pursue at, uh, to your very best abilities. Um, Outside of that, I think you just need to address some uh, more of the staff comments as you go forward. 
The architecture, I mean, Carrie, I mean, I know you've heard what everyone here had to say tonight. I, I hope you take it to heart. I, I hope you, um, I just hope you consider what's being said. And I, you know, when you bring things forward, and beauty is, trust me, in the eye of the beholder. I can't tell you how many, I mean, I made fun of somebody's project. I shouldn't have done it, but I called somebody's color ugly one day, and I realized that there's six other businesses that have that color all over town. And, I, you know, we catch ourselves once in a while. Um, but I think what you, what you are hearing is probably um, a portion of what some of the bigger concerns are. You know, traffic's always a tough one. It's tough everywhere in Scarborough, so... I'm not sure there's a whole lot in, in designing this phase that you can do to help calm traffic throughout Ballantyne and, and the rest of the development. But if you come across these creative ways, I think, you know, it, it behooves you to, to really try to jump on it and do something special here. So uh, with that said, I'm, I'm over with comment. Roger needs one more. Yeah. I got two questions. Two. Just general questions. Uh, uh, on the community center, uh, Carrie. As far as I can tell, this is going to be the first community center you're putting in the, in the whole development. Is that correct? You don't go any, uh, in, anywhere else? We don't have one anywhere in Eastern Village at this time. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then the other question I have is, um, when you or your realtor have been talking to people, prospective owners, are they fully aware of the total build-up Well, the brokers that I work with are. Um, I think people, that's why they come to Eastern Village, until they live there and then they, you know. But, um, you know, I don't, there's, a, there's houses that come up for sale down there, they go under contract in a day. The last four that came up uh, this spring all went under contract within, I think the last one was uh, five days. So they go under contract just like that when they come up. We make sure that we tell everybody what the potential is for this particular site that we've talked about anybody on this site. As far as the rest of the project, there's a, you know, there's a subdivision plan that if their, their broker is, we don't talk to all brokers. There's people who list their houses with other brokers, so we don't, we don't get a chance to. But I think that anybody that's doing their due diligence, build, buying into a project of this size and of this dense uh, should look at that. And if they see open space, kind of figure that it's probably going to be developed because, um, you know, where it's located. Um, I make sure that I do, uh, but I can't tell you about brokers that I don't come in contact with. We will see you again soon, I suspect. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item is the staff report. I do not have anything at this time. Administrative amendment report. Uh, there's been one administrative amendment approved since the last meeting, and that's for an outdoor restaurant service at the Texas Roadhouse okay. restaurant. And folks, um, we are going to wrap this up really soon. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. We appreciate your comments and your patience getting to the point where you could actually participate. So um, we are on correspondence. Do we have any correspondence? Planning board comments? Seeing none, I will motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion and second. All in favor? Thank you, folks. That was a lot of hard work tonight. I appreciate it.